Welcome to today's City Council meeting. If you've joined us in the last several weeks, you know that due to the ongoing practice of social distancing, our council meetings continue to be entirely remote. Please keep joining us remotely and stay safe and stay healthy. Although conducting meetings electronically is different than our familiar in-person public meeting process, this is still considered an open and public meeting. We welcome members of the public who may be watching or uh, who may be watching our video as usual um, on a council page or our YouTube page, SLC TV or Facebook Live. Today is a work session only, and so there is no public comment scheduled. However, next Tuesday, June 2nd, there will be an opportunity for the public to comment on the fiscal year 2020-2021 budget, as well as any other topics during our 7 p.m. formal meeting. And as always, feedback is always welcome. Uh, you can mail us a letter at P.O. Box 145476, Salt Lake City, Utah, 84114, or by emailing us at council.comments at slcgov.com, or by calling our 24-hour phone comment line. The number for that is 801-535-7654. Before we move on to the work session items, I want to mention that we do have a closed session item uh, tonight, item number 11. A separate link for participants to join that closed session meeting has been provided. Once participants join that meeting, uh, or excuse me, once our participants join the closed meeting, please remember to join us from a space that is separate and private so that others cannot hear the discussion. We'll now move on to our work session items. Our first item includes, um, uh, we ha had a tentative update um, to about uh, updating people um, on their mayor's proclamations relating to COVID-19 and the March earthquake. Um, did we end up having any um, issues that came up that we wanted to address on this matter or do we want to move on to agenda item number two? Mr. Chair, I think it's okay to move on to item number two since nothing new has come up since Tuesday. Okay, great. Thank you. So we'll go ahead and move on to agenda item number two, which is uh, a resolution for an amendment to the Central Wasatch Commission interlocal agreement, including the admission of the town of Brighton. Uh, today, for the briefing, we have with us Sam Owens from the City Council office, Laura Briefer from, uh, the, excuse me, the Director of Public Utilities. Um, we also have Blake Perez, the Deputy Director for the Central Wasatch Commission. And um, I received a call uh, last week from Ralph Becker, the director of the Central Wasatch Commission, indicating that uh, he would not be able to join us for this briefing and sending his regrets. Um, but um, so he, he did indicate that, that Blake would be here. So um, Blake, we hope, is Blake with us? I'm here, council member. Okay, great. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So Sam, let's go ahead and start with you and then um, you can hand it off to Laura and Blake, okay? All right, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. So um, briefly, uh, in terms of an introduction or an overview on the Central Wasatch Commission, um, the Central Wasatch Commission is an interlocal agency charged with implementing the Mountain Accord. Salt Lake City is among the commission's four founding partners, along with Sandy City, Salt Lake County, and the city of Codmore Heights. Since its inception, the commission has expanded from its original makeup and now uh, proposes an amendment that would bring the voting members of the board to nine through the addition of the town of Brighton. The CWC interlocal agreement as amended in the proposal also provides for a number of ex officio seats as it has done previously. Uh, these are non-voting members and those seats are limited to no more than four other uh, kind of like structural and technical changes are made to the interlocal agreement, um, specifically having to do with the definition and scope of membership uh, in member service. Uh, as well as the process through which membership is ratified. Um, in addition to the, the founding members um, and the uh, possible addition of the town of Brighton, the, the town of Alta, Mill Creek, Park City, and Summit County also currently have uh, voting seats on the board. Um, 
just because it is the budget time, this is not a budget briefing, but um, in terms of the uh, kind of specifications that we provide for the other entities the council hears about right now, I think uh, the Central Wasatch Commission has four full-time employees and, and an intern. Um, Blake can correct me on that um, if it's incorrect. And the the expense budget for the commission proposed for fiscal year 21 is $702,600. Um, the revenue proposal for fiscal year 21, I think is $654,000 based on the May 1st proposed budget, which is not adopted yet. Uh, and with that, Mr. Chair, I would ask that we turn it over to um, Director Briefer and Deputy Director Blake Perez. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you. This is uh, Laura Briefer with the Public Utilities Department. And um, I did wanna just add a little bit of context. Um, Mountain Accord was something that Salt Lake City was involved in very deeply with um, since its inception in, in 2012 as a consortium of stakeholders looking to find some long-term solutions surrounding transportation, um, environmental protection, recreational use of the canyons and the economic benefits of those canyons. And um, this was a process that I've been involved in um, quite intimately for <laughs> many years. Um, Mountain Accord um, ended up with a recommendation to form a um, government agency in order to implement the agreement of the accord. And um, the agency was formed via state law and actually um, came into being in 2017 was, was when it officially became a government agency. Um, the funding for Central Wasatch Commission comes from the um, commission membership um, primarily, and Salt Lake City is on that commission. Mayor Mendenhall represents Salt Lake City on the Central Wasatch Commission. Um, I and my staff are also very involved in a number of different um, subcommittees on the governance of the commission, as well as some of the topical areas such as um, transportation, recreation, watershed protection. Um, the study area of the Central Wasatch Commission um, includes a good portion of the watersheds that provide most of Salt Lake City and our service area water supply. So we have a, a very profound interest in um, the work of the Central Wasatch Commission and we approach um, the work with the commission with that interest in mind. Um, the town of Brighton was newly created and uh, the town um, is actually surrounded by the Central Wasatch Commission study area and as such, similar to the town of Alta, asked to be a member of the commission's board. And with that, I'll let Blake continue on because that's a big uh, component of the um, updated interlocal agreement. Thanks, Laura. Uh, thanks, Council, for having me. Uh, I think Sam and Laura uh, outlined the amendments to the interlocal agreement adequately. Um, in addition to the uh, addition of Town of Brighton, we're, we're looking to add ex officios um, to help us in our uh, development uh, and plans. <clears throat> um, UTA um, um, stands to be an ex officio in the coming weeks, um, and we're looking at adding some additional expertise on that front. Um, there's also some cleanup on the membership. We're eliminating the term Wasatch back and, and, and exchanging that for Summit County. Um, and then, uh, as Sam and Laura mentioned earlier, uh, there's just some uh, membership criteria that we're adding to the interlocal agreement. Um, Mayor Mendenhall has been a tremendous asset since she started at the beginning of the year. She's currently serving as our treasurer. Uh, she's in, been involved with our short-term projects committee. Um, and, and which recently funded uh, half a dozen uh, really important projects um, across the Wasatch Mountains. Uh, some of the other work that uh, the Central Wasatch Commission is working on uh, this year, we have a mountain transportation system initiative that we're trying to develop uh, that is a regional trans that connects into the regional transportation system and meets the objectives uh, and challenges uh, in those mountains. And of course, we're continuing to pursue our National Conservation Recreation Area uh, Act um, with our congressional delegation and uh, members from the Utah State Legislature.
Great, thank you very much. Um, council members, are there any questions about this item? Councilmember Rogers. Uh, Laura or Blake, do you see any other amendments coming in the future to adding other cities or others that might want to enter into this? Good question, council member. Um, the ex officio status, um, we've been discussing this and this could be a great way for maybe future members. Uh, the city of Draper was a member of the Mountain Accord and, and they may have interest in participating in the future. Um, and Wasatch County uh, may have an interest in, in, in joining the Central Wasatch Commission, but those are really preliminary discussions. Uh, and I don't foresee, uh, you know, within the next six months to a year, any additional full-time members, maybe uh, the addition of some ex officio members. Okay, any other questions? Okay. Mr. Chairman, sorry, <clears throat> just one uh, point then. Um, the uh, timeline in the staff report identifies June 9th as an opportunity for the council to take action. And uh, there's been some sentiment um, about the possibility of the council considering action on June 2nd instead. I don't know if that's something that uh, the council members would like to discuss right now or um, where that is something that figures in this discussion. Okay. Um, does anybody have any uh, council member Rogers? I would support that. Um, is there anybody that has any concerns with, um, with that? Okay, um, I, I don't see anyone uh, raising their hands. I don't have any concerns with it either. So um, let's go ahead and do that. And thank you, Sam, for bringing that up. Um, is there anything else that we need to discuss in order to, uh, to get that on the agenda for adoption? Nope. Okay, great, thank you. Let's move on then to the next agenda item, which is agenda item number three, budget amendment number six for fiscal year 2019-20. We have with us, um, let's see. No, sorry, my uh, Adobe just closed and so I don't have my um, agenda with us. Who, who do we have with us on this item? Can staff Tell me while I get my agenda back up. Uh, Council Chair, yes. Um, at the presenters, we have Ben Ludke from the Council Office, as well as Sylvia. We also have Mary Beth Thompson and John Vuk. Vuk, sorry. Well, okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Or, wait, is it Bo or Voight? Vike. Oh, Vike, John <laughs> Thanks, John. Sorry about that. I know you've, I've had to ask you to correct me before, so my apologies. No problem. Um, ben, do you want to start us off and uh, then we can pass it on to um, the members of the administration? I'll give a quick intro and then Mary Beth and Lisa McCarver will provide an update on revenue projections and fund balance. Great. Thank you. This is the sixth budget amendment for fiscal year 20. This is the first briefing. A public hearing is scheduled for June 2nd and the council is scheduled to take action on June 9th, which is the same day action might be taken on the fiscal year 21 annual budget. Budget amendment six contains 18 adjustments totaling $7.2 million. Of those, 57,500 are proposed to come from fund balance for eight new items. The updated revenue projections are approximately $8.3 million less than the projections in budget amendment number five the council received back in March. And I'll turn the time over to Mary Beth and Lisa. 
So we'll have Lisa go through and talk through the revenue projections, and then we will talk through fund balance projections. Hi, council members, Lisa McCarver here from finance. Um, just to walk you through just briefly, the revenue projections that you're seeing on this amendment, um, there has been quite a swing from the last time we presented the projections to you. You know, a few months ago, we were actually running above budget on a lot of our uh, major revenue categories, but you know, with COVID and the issues that the economy is having, we are seeing this swing. Um, this is a similar, um, these are similar numbers to the ones we presented during the budget. So I will just go through these quickly. And if you have any questions, feel free to stop me. As far as uh, property taxes, we are seeing those at budget right now. Our actuals are at budget and we expect that to continue through the next few months. Um, the sales and use tax really is, you know, our biggest concern and it's the place that we're monitoring the closest. Um, you know, there's three factors really that are going into this. One, the, the hardest one to understand is the timing and when the impact will hit the hardest from the pandemic. Um, also kind of understanding where the city and the state are is in terms of opening up to our new normal and also the effects of unemployment and the labor force on being able to help the economy bounce back. Um, so right now we're projecting that our sales and use taxes will be a little over a million dollars short of budget. Um, also franchise taxes, we've kind of mentioned this in the past, it continues to be an issue that the franchise taxes are running below budget. Um, let's see some of the other notable ones. Um, our intergovernmental revenues, we're showing those under budget, we're, we're monitoring this because we don't know what the gas tax effect is going to be on our Class C road funds. So this is the number we're projecting at this time, and we do continue that. Um, interest income is running 900000 under budget. You know, interest rates are low right now, and we are definitely seeing the effects of those. In the fines and forfeiture area, this is, you know, we're experiencing significant downturn in our fines as a result of COVID-19. Um, parking ticket revenue is down. We have not been issuing tickets. Um, moving violations are down. And also our justice court fines are down. Um, the parking meter collection, we were seeing a lower trend prior to COVID-19, but now we're experiencing less travel and uh, free parking because of the pandemic. So we're expecting those to be about 1.2 million under budget. Um, the charges and services area, 613,000 under budget. This is mostly from our recreation fees and our special events that, you know, things are being canceled. Uh, we aren't seeing the reservations that we were seeing in the past. Hopefully as things get back to normal, we can, we can continue to monitor those and maybe see some positive changes there, but right now we're projecting it at 613,000 on budget. Um, our miscellaneous revenue category, you know, this is where collections revenue is. And of course that uh, collections are down because of the moratorium on that. Um, but we do have that offset by a payment we received from the Leonardo for their past due utilities. So we are seeing a little positive variance there. And then in the interfund reimbursement area, we're seeing a positive variance based on uh, the fire service reimbursement that we received from the airport. Um, transfers are slightly below budget just based on transfers from CDBG and the Arts Council that are coming in lower than budget. Um, we, we broke out the, the uh, special sales tax revenue areas for you to look at. The half cent is the funding our future and the county option sales tax. We are showing those separately for you. You know, we were really conservative when we projected those revenues for FY20. Um, we are seeing them um, currently trending above budget. So at least there's some good news in those two areas. Are there any questions?
I'm sorry, Council Chair, I think you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, I, are there any questions from council members on uh, this budget amendment? Um, is this the last one we're going to have for 2019-2020 or uh, is there one more coming? Um, so I believe I can answer this. Um, we told, we um, spoke about giving you updates on a monthly basis. I don't think you'll see anything before you adopt the fiscal year 21 budget, um, but um, we will continue to update this because we have actually two months of what we call accruals, which means that that money is received in July and August that actually will back post to fiscal year 20. Um, so you'll kind of see a combination of both and sometimes that's difficult for, um, for people to understand because our major revenue sources, sales tax, property tax, franchise tax, um, permits, business licensing, all of those have a, an accrual component that push back into the last fiscal year or fiscal year 20, right? So fiscal year 21 then is delayed pretty much until September because we don't see any real revenues coming in until September. So we will keep you updated on this, but understand that fiscal year 21s will be pretty much, you know, we're going to just have to do a guessing game, but fiscal year 20s will be actuals as we go forward. Great. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Rogers. On budget amendment six, item D7. Let's see, it's the housing stability programs. Um, that was... Now, correct me if I'm wrong, staff, that money is coming from the Housing Trust Fund to this program. Is that what's proposed? That, that is correct. I think Cindy was going to speak to this item maybe a little bit later. I think we were planning on having Chris go through each of the oh, items in the budget well amendment. Then, but, all right. but we can jump to it if we're ready no, to do that. <laughs> no, it's no big deal. We can, we can talk through it then. That's fine. We can go through it. Thank you. Sorry, I mentioned earlier that my um, Adobe shut down, so it took me a while. I had to restart it and pull it up. So, um, so yeah, I'll just go ahead and read through the titles of each of the amendments in the budget, and then if you have a um, question about those, let me know, um, or uh, you could wait until we've read through all the titles and and out, go back and ask about others. So, yep. yep. Council Chair, yes, this is Mary Beth um, Thompson. Would you like me to walk through fund balance projections prior to, or would you like to just go forward with the um, items on BA6? Um, go, yeah, why don't you go ahead and do the projections and then I'll, and then after that, I'll read the items and then we can go into questions. Okay, um, so 2020 um, fund balance projections the biggest thing that I wanted to note here is that we have included the revenue forecast in the budget projections. Um, if it's positive, we usually don't include those, but if it's neg, I mean, obviously we wanted to show you the impact and what is happening at this point. Obviously the 5.1 million will change or could change or hopefully not, I'm, I don't know. <laughs> um, but I wanted to note that this includes all revenue adjustments and expenditure adjustments for all the budget amendments. And then it also includes the revenue forecast change at the very bottom so that you can see where our fund balance is sitting at this point, which is 14.46%. And it also includes this budget amendment as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. So um, now we'll just go ahead and go through them line by line. Um, and under section A, new items, we have parks and public lands office expansion. That's a CIP in the amount of 338,310. Uh, item A2 is uh, open space property acquisition, parks impact fees um, in the amount of 350,000. Item A3 is the 911 dispatch center cost reimbursement. Uh, that's from the general fund in the amount of 72,331. Item A4 is police department revenue and expense for the UN conference. That's coming from the general fund in the amount of 97,249. 
Item A5 is fire department cost recovery. That's coming from the general fund in the amount of 20,000. Item A6 is the Utah Communications Authority donation um, coming from the donation fund in the amount of 3,228,598. Uh, item A7 is Fair Park, Rose Park, Family Learning Center uh, from the general fund, 57,500 and from the fleet fund, 55,000. <clears> Item A8 is earthquake damage repair from the CIP fund in the amount of $2 million uh, um, from, uh, our, from our property insurer. Let's see, section B, and um, there are no items. Section C, there are no items. Section D, under housekeeping items, we have item D1 to move economic development loan fund uh, to fund class 76. This is an accounting adjustment for housing and other loan funds in the amount of $2,753,077. Item D2 is rooftop solar asset donation. Uh, that's coming from the refuse fund in the amount of 486,962. Item D3 is the Gallivan Utah Center Owners Association cost increase from the donation fund in the amount of 62,302. Item D4 is uh, the uh, gap accounting for key security lease for IMS coming from the IMS fund in the amount of 1,889,636. Item D5 is uh, police recognizing uh, revenue from natural resources contract from the general fund in the amount of 1,115, or excuse me, yeah. The amount, of, excuse me, 115,000. Item D6 is police recognizing revenue from Salt Lake County contract for COVID uh, response in parks from the general fund in the amount of $134,400. Item D7 is housing sustainable, sustainability programs reallocation from the housing trust fund in the amount of $1.1 million. Um, Item G or section E is grants, for, um, which uh, there are no new grants included. Sorry, go ahead. Mr. Chair, sorry, Mr. Yes. Chair, I think you were going to on D seven because um, staff um, provided the write up to the council um, after yeah. the packets were published. I think you were going to turn that time over to somebody to talk further about. Yes, that's right. So um, thank you for stopping before I get too far into E one. Cindy, do you want to talk about item D seven? Uh, yes, but Council Member Rogers uh, wanted to raise it. I don't know if he has, if he wants to ask a question first. Jay, Council Member Rogers, do you want to ask your question, or do you want to wait until Cindy has well, um, presented to us on this? Let's let's see if I'm sure Cindy will be able to answer my question. That way, it would be easier. Okay, let's do that. Okay, so um, basically, this is a little bit of an unusual process, but we're in a very unusual time with the COVID emergency. Uh, the administration is uh, proposing that some funds be repurposed uh, for a program that would help with housing stability. Part of that money would go to uh, rental assistance, and that would be administered by county, or by, sorry, community partners that um, already have existing programs in place and need additional funds in order to, to help come closer to meeting the need. Um, and then another part of it is $100,000 for rapid rehousing, which I believe is to get people out of the uh, shelter and into housing um, whenever possible. And then the third part is a mortgage assistance program and that is a new program to the city. Uh, it, as I understand it, the administration is looking at having um, community organizations administer that. Uh, there probably hasn't been mortgage grant programs before, but the organizations that would administer this have uh, loan underwriting and loan issuing and management experience. So um, the proposal from the administration is for, it's actually 1.1 million to come from the um, revolving loan fund. 
and the revolving housing loan fund, uh, housing trust fund, is uh, has its roots in um, some money that the city got from the federal government, I think over 30 years ago. I'm not sure on the timing, but... Um, and the city, as that as it was loaned out and it was repaid to the city, then it was no longer federal funds, but the elected officials at the time decided to put that into, into this housing revolving loan fund so that it could, could continue to be of use. So um, moving it would be a, a different use. It's a, it's a policy shift, but it is still for housing. If you wanted to keep it for keep that fund for housing uh, development for affordable housing uh, and have it be continue to be revolving loan program. Uh, you could use a different source for this program that the administration is recommending. So um, two or three sources and I can go over those. Is that okay? Yes, please. Okay. All right. So one would be um, there's some funding that's in the Community Land Trust, and this is funding that was appropriated in uh, 2018 and 19 or 19 and 20, and uh, then $500,000 that you have before you in this budget to um, to appropriate uh, that. That program is one that the council has been interested in, but it, it hasn't gotten off the ground yet. And I think the administration, um, as, as far as I know, they, they don't have a program that's about ready to launch or anything like that. So so question is whether you want to go ahead and utilize that funding because it is right now just sitting. Um, you could utilize that for this or for some other purpose in your in your budget and then come back later and replenish it. Um, and then another would be uh, to consider the COVID-19 funding that's coming uh, from the federal government through through Salt Lake County in, in at least one of the cases. There are, I think, maybe three or, or more different types of funding that will come from the federal government. Uh, we know a fair amount about a couple of those, but it's not perfect information. There's clearly though enough funding if you wanted to handle it like sales tax or property tax and anticipate the receipt of that revenue and go ahead and appropriate it for the use of this program. So that would be specifically a program that is designed to help communities with the COVID-19 crisis. Um, so so that that is a, a tool that we hadn't thought of earlier because we were thinking we needed to wait to get the money in hand. But if we were doing that with sales tax and property tax, we wouldn't be running the city. So it's the same principle. Um, and then if you, if you don't wanna do either of those things as alternate sources, you could um, use the Housing Trust Fund Revolving Loan Program that the administration recommended and then um, express your intent to come back and uh, refill that loan program uh, so that it's at its uh, full capacity. And, and you could do that once you identify uh, other, other funds or um, or once you feel more assured about the COVID funding or um, once the economy approves, it could be, you know, any number of things, just an intent wouldn't obligate you, but it would give you um, a reminder to come back to that. And the final option that staff came up with is to use funds from the, the judgment levy. Uh, if the council approved that judgment levy, that would be ample funding to, um, put in into this program. That one we're not really suggesting because you probably will have other needs for that money. Um, you may, you know, you have concerns about police overtime and, and things like that. So, um, so that one isn't a great idea. The other, the other three options are 
um, entirely within the norm of what you would uh, typically consider. So that's it for me. Um, I'll start with Councilmember Rogers. Did that um, help answer the question that you had, or did you have a question? Um, no, I mean, it did and it didn't. I guess my, my question is, going back to Cindy, what is staff's recommendation then if we do not want to take from the revolving loan fund in the, house, in the uh, housing trust fund? So I know you came up, you gave us three actual doable scenarios. Is there a preferred scenario by the administration? Which recommendation did they say? Uh, we, we did share these ideas with them, but did not ask if they preferred one over another. Um, I think that you're going to end up having conversations about all of these as you look for other sources, um, as you are looking for budget money. Um, the one thing that we need to know from you tonight is if you prefer to go ahead and use the housing trust fund uh, as recommended, or if you prefer to use another pot of funding. So, and Sorry. I should, first question is, do you want to do the program? <laughs> Second is, um, do you, do you want to do uh, the housing trust fund or some other source? Right. Can, I think that's what I was trying to get at Mr. Chair is that, that's how I feel. I, I would feel a lot more comfortable not removing money from an already established fund, but um, I would look at, you know, the other funding scenarios that, that staff has come up with. So I see Councilmember Valdemoros and Fowler, but Mayor Mendenhall had her hand up. I want to see if she um, was going to address this topic. Mayor? Yeah, thank you. Um, and I think Rachel, if she, I don't know if she has her hand up, might want to address the piece about the um, dialogue between our branches. But uh, the timing, as Cindy mentioned, we, we know we have some surety about getting future funds from the feds through the county or the state or both. And we know about that first tranche of funding. It isn't here yet, but we can go ahead and find ways to begin to deploy anticipating its arrival. Um, I, I just, I, I do think that I know that we have a need in the community right now today. I do think this is consistent with the policy, but I also want to speak about the tranches of funding that are coming and, and which we've mentioned before. I think actually we talked about it on Tuesday at the last council meeting, but that we are taking um, national data about who isn't accessing, who's been had barriers to accessing federal support in terms of businesses. And then we're coupling that with local data, some of which has been done through the county. Um, Dina Blaze just presented some more local data on Friday at the county meeting. Um, and so we're looking at who needs extra support or hasn't been able to access the federal funding. And then we're also bringing to that all of the engagement with the local nonprofits and um, organizations that work with communities that we know have been hit harder with the virus and have other barriers to funding. And we are excited to bring to you, and as we mentioned Tuesday, in the next couple of weeks, program proposals or allocation proposals that are absolutely qualified as as best we can tell through legal means that um, they can we can use those COVID funds for it, but that really are um, strategically addressing the needs of our local community based on all the national data, local data, and the conversations we're having. So I, I guess I would just urge you to not, um, I don't think that's the proposal here, but to start pulling from the uh, 5.8 and the second and third tranches and, and um, immediately you know, dump that into something because I think there's a, a really good strategy that we can take based on a, a broader perspective and data. And we, we will get there, hopefully, I don't know if it will be by next week, I hope so, perhaps the following week. Thanks for giving me a second, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Rachel Otto, did you want to talk about the communications between our staff? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, thank you, Councilmember Rogers, for the question. I also, I'm, I'd like to just, if, if you could just think back for a second about, you know, a couple of months ago when we were really starting to be in the, in the throes of this crisis, we were... Um, we started a conversation about how we can kind of quickly deploy resources to residents who are struggling. 
And we reached out to Jim Wood at the Kempsey Gardner Policy Institute to get some more accurate data on um, where we were right now. And so what we found, what we found um, at that point was that we have, we do have, as the mayor just said, a, a really significant need in the community. And as we were looking for different funding sources, we were looking for something that we could deploy kind of in between where the um, eviction moratorium left off and where those stimulus checks maybe kind of ran out and where the CARES funding would kick in towards the end of June or early July. So we identified the housing trust fund money as money that we could quickly reappropriate um, in this way. So the, you know, the, the need is greater and, and I could give you the, the more specific figures from Jim Wood, but the need is greater for renters than people who need mortgage assistance. But so that's kind of where, where you see those different funds identified there um, in different amounts. But the, the fact is that the need is, is quite great right now with people who are struggling. And then the, the other kind of alarming thing that Jim Wood revealed to us is that we have um, really significant job loss that's happening just from February through May, job loss predicted at, um, I think, let's, let's see, 426,000 jobs statewide, and then 49% of all Salt Lake City residents are employed in industries that are very vulnerable to layoffs. So that was the impetus behind this. And um, just to return to kind of that original question of the dialogue between staffs, we, I don't think that the administration necessarily has some sort of a you know, preferred alternative approach other than what we've proposed with the housing trust fund um, pot of money. And I like the, you know, I've, I've appreciated the open dialogue with council staff on you know, maybe being able to use the housing trust fund, but then committing to backfill it or you know, some approach like that. Because as the mayor said, it's not that we're gonna see the needs decrease as we get that first $5.8 million tranche. And we're gonna have, I think, plenty of other community needs that we're gonna want you know, in conjunction with the council to fulfill with, with that $5.8 million. So this was a quick way to get assistance to those who need it. Um, we'll, we'll have more detailed proposals on those next tranches of money too. And, oh, sorry, just to clarify, I think the timing on the deployment of the funds would be the same no matter which source you choose. So I'm not aware that, that one of these sources would be slower than the others. And Cindy, and if I might, Mr. Chair, um, Cindy, I think what you just pointed out on being able to um, make a budget for those anticipated funds is something that we had not been able to identify when we first brought this proposal to you. Right. That's a really, it's a yeah. really important point. Yeah. Uh, just new information as we go. Learning something every single day. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, council member Valdemar, I'll see you had your hand up first. Do you still have a question? Yeah, I have a question on, so let's say, let's say, we use this revolving loan fund money, the $1.1 million, but we want to replenish it um, at a later time. Can we replenish it with some of that federal money that we will get? Is that possible? Is that legal? Is that we, we don't know that yet. I mean, it's very likely that you could, but we don't, we don't know that yet. I don't think all the rules are out unless the administration can correct me on that. I mean, clearly assisting people with their rent or mortgage to prevent homelessness, it's a pretty safe bet, I think, that that qualifies. I don't know if you can repay yourselves. Um, right. in, you know, certainly there will be some things like through FEMA and, and that type of thing, expenditures that have been made, you can repay uh, the city with, I just don't know enough, and and maybe the administration does. Um, Rachel or uh, Mayor, do you, do you have the answer to that question yet? As Cindy just said, I know that you know that it's 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 clearly an anticipated COVID related expense that will would be reimbursable, but in terms of the logistics around being able to backfill the housing trust fund 
program. I don't know that there's anything that's been released that would preclude us from doing that. It's probably a good question for um, Mary Beth and Katie if there's been that kind of specific direction around it. I don't think that there has been. And I'll add that what we've been hearing from Jen Cavino, who we're coordinating with weekly as it evolves, is that the Treasury, um, they already have loosened some of the the language to allow greater um, flexibility for count cities and counties to deploy the funding. And um, for example, I actually, I, I won't try to give um, details, but Jen Cavino could be a great check-in for us all, maybe in a future council meeting also. But what we're hearing about the um, future funding, like the, the fourth piece of legislation that's on the table right now is uh, very much about reimbursement for cities and giving um, flexibility for us to leverage that. It's absolutely not a guarantee at this point, but I, they have already made steps to loosen the three pieces of legislation that have come out and the fourth is shaping up to be in that same direction. But it'd be great to hear from them. So let, let's, plan, let, let's say we plan for worst case scenario. We release these funds for the emergency, then we get the funds from the federal government and the federal government says, no, you cannot reimburse yourself for something that you used before. So this money cannot go. You need to show us that this money, we got it on May 1st, then whatever you paid or help May 1st on, that's where we're going to reimburse you guys or that qualifies. So anything that you did before that, you know, so worst case scenario, that's a, a how do we replenish the $1.1 million out of the housing trust fund? Uh, Council Chair, this is Mary Beth. Can I speak a little bit to this? Yes, um, please. So it, right now, CARES Act says that if it's unbudgeted by March 27th, then you can use the funding. I'm not so sure that I have the details pertaining to whether this qualifies for funding or not. But what I would tell you is that um, I perceive that this is going to go into um, what we would call a reimbursable grant fund for us so that we could track the costs and expenditures. Um, so if you were planning on using whatever you were using this money for, we would run it through grant. I wouldn't stick this money in the general fund. I wouldn't put this money directly to the housing trust fund, right? It would be after the grant bucket of money would reimburse whatever allocation it would be inside whatever programs the mayor or council decide to uh, go forth with. Okay, thank you. Um, so I see Councilmember Dugan, I see Councilmember Mono, but I think um, Councilmember Fowler had her hand up first, so we'll go to her and then come back to the two of you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I certainly understand the need for the programs and I agree with them. I think um, I share some concerns that I think Councilmember Rogers shares with me as well. I don't want to take this 1.1, especially knowing that we have other funding sources. I don't want to take anything out of the housing trust fund because I worry that then we say, oh, but we have these other needs and these other needs and these other needs, and we just don't ever get it back. And that housing trust fund money, if we remember, is money for the ex deeply affordable housing. And yes, we need to make sure that we're saving people's rents and mortgages because we don't want people that are vulnerable to then end up becoming homeless. And I 100% I agree with that and, and recognize how much more expensive it is to rehouse somebody than to keep somebody housed. Um, but we're also going to, in the long term, going to need to have money available for that deeply affordable housing. And if we deplete the money that we have right now that, that goes towards that I just worry we're not going to get it back. And I would, my opinion at this point would be to look at those other funding sources that our staff has provided and see if we can work something out. Whatever is the best option of those funding sources, I'm not sure, but I think we need to look at those other funding sources before looking at, at taking this out of the housing trust fund. That's just where I sit at the moment, so. Okay. Um Council member uh, Mono, I think you were next. Thanks, and I hope my audio is better today. Um, I My question is, it, what is the total value of the housing trust fund? And the point is, what percentage of that are we 
moving from the trust fund into this new program? Is it 10% of it, 5% of it, or half of it? You know, like what is, and I guess that would be the value that's sitting there plus what is, uh, what we expect to get returned from loan payments. Do we know that number? Um, can it Mary, can you yeah, Mary answer the question? I'm not so sure that I can answer that question. Um, I may have to ask from assistance from Brent Beck. What I will tell you is right now there's current cash balance of $2.1 million sitting in there. Um, what I can't tell you off the top of my head is how much is in the receivables or loan repayments is what is what probably the more typical terminology is. What the loan repayment outstanding balances are at this time off the top of my head, I don't know that answer. Council okay, staff looked into this a couple months ago, and it was a little over $14.5 million, but those are repayments over, I think it was a 30-year horizon into the future, and we would certainly want to double check because that information is dated from earlier this year. The other um, issue is that we don't know how many of those loans have clauses in them that would say that the um, city administration has the authority to waive repayment at a certain point. So uh, that would take quite a bit of investigation. And we're working with the administration to get more transparency. We, I think we have the same goals as the current administration does to just get a little more clarity and a little easier um, access to information. So we, in the future, I think we'll be able to answer that question better than we can right now. Hey, um, Council Member Dugan, I think you were next. So just kind of going on top of Darren's comments, so at 1.1 million from the Housing Trust Fund, how long would it take us to uh, replenish that coffer if we didn't just take it from the Fed's re reimbursement? And how much of that funding do we use every year to fund the uh, deep, uh, housing problems that were that uh, uh, council member Fowler mentioned because that's important the, the amount that's transferred to the RDA to fund housing development um, just for the last two years has been 2.2.5 2.6 million um, each year this amount that's sitting in the housing trust fund was um, sort of unanticipated and what was repaid from last year to this year um, but it's not clear to us if that represents a unusual year of repayments or a standard year of repayments. And that's one of those things that, um, as Mary Beth and Cindy both referenced, that we're working on getting a better understanding of. And so it, I don't know that it's really possible to answer your question of how long would it take us to recoup that money at this point. Hopefully in the next, um, in the coming months, we'll be able to answer that. And one more on top of that. So, and are we required to... Uh, repay that money within one year or do we have, can we repay that as a loan over multiple years? So 1.1. You, you don't, it's entirely your discretion. There are no okay. strings on that money. So it's just simply if you, if you, it's just a policy, just weighing the pros and cons and there are pros and cons to each. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, council members, other questions on this? Um, I would be interested in, and council member Rogers. Um, I would be, I mean, I, I think this needs to be spoken about, um, in regards to the mortgage assistance program. And I brought this up before. Um, I, I just, I don't know. I feel a little awkward with us paying mortgage. I mean, that you go into that question of, somebody who owns a home. I mean, there's a lot of policy discussion that needs to be spoken out there because somebody that owes, owns their home during COVID, I think a, a lot of individuals received letters speaking about if you needed relief from that, you can have, you know, a 90 day period or, you know, you can do a reverse mortgage. There's just a lot more options for people. And uh, my question is, if we're looking at doing that and that's the way we're, we're looking at helping in this program, when is too far down the rabbit hole, too far down the rabbit hole? I mean, who makes that decision when somebody's 90 days behind on their end? Is that, I mean, on their mortgage, is that when you do say, okay, that's not when we're, where we're going to help somebody out. So, I mean, for me, there's a lot of questions in that. 
uh, in that program. And I still feel like I don't want to pull it out. And if the, if the money is going to come in for emergency funding, let's use that specifically for what it is and not pull it out of some, some uh, fund that we already have that's working. So I don't know, can anyone from not our staff, but um, the department answer that question? Um, yeah, if somebody can, from the administration can, I, we do have a mortgage assistance program currently though. Isn't that right? Can you answer? There's a, there's a federal program that allows you to delay your mortgage and you, you tag it onto the back end of your mortgage. So you right now have say 300 more mortgage payments to make. If you go three months or four months without making a payment, you take those payments and you add them onto the back end of your mortgage. So the bankers and the mortgage and the uh, uh, the homeowner work that out. Right. But you add it onto the back end. No, that's not the one I'm thinking of. Um, Lonnie, do you want to speak to this? Sure. Thank you, Council Chair. Um, I think my understanding of the question is whether or not the city works with our community partners for mortgage assistance currently. Um, I think, it, well, Councilmember Rogers' question, and interrupt me if I get it wrong, James, is is this um, an area that, that we should be getting into and how far uh, do we get into it before we feel like we've gone too far? And my question was just a clarification of I know that HAM has advertised current mortgage assistant programs. How is that different than what, what Council Member Rogers' is, is question is? Sure, so thank you for that clarification. Um, we do work with our partners, um, NeighborWorks, Salt Lake, and uh, Community Development Corporation of Utah for down payment assistance in that realm of mortgage assistance. So, um, that is the current mechanism we use with our community partners. I thought there was a, like if somebody was in danger of uh, missing a mortgage payment that they could apply for some assistance from the city as well. Am yes. I misremembering? That's, that's no, you're remembering correctly. That's a very new program under funding our future. And it is um, based on usually like an unexpected car or medical mm -hmm. or other expense. And that can be um, utilized for rent or mortgage um, payment assistance. Okay, are, that's are those thought. grants or loans? Those are grants in the current uh, funding our future program. Okay, gotcha. Um, Lonnie, did you want to speak to more to Councilmember Rogers' question about um, or or Mayor? Do you want to chime in on? Um, on your with your thoughts on that thanks mr chair i think the um uh i guess i i honestly am a little bit um baffled because we we set up the funding our future affordable housing fund to help people um access housing and and hopefully create housing opportunities and We've been going about that with a couple of different programs. And what we're talking about here is, you know, there is a spectrum of affordability to be sure in people who could hypothetically come in and access some of this funding, that the 1.1 that we're talking about. And maybe we want to narrow the scope and make sure that it's only for individuals that are 80% AMI and below or something. I'm just making that up. But we're talking about keeping them in their housing now. And it, it just, um, it's not like, it, to me, it doesn't seem like a, a dramatic policy shift here. It's about the, essentially we could have helped the same people last year get into the housing with the Funding Our Future dollars. And because of this crisis, we, we should be keep helping them stay in that housing. And so if the parameters of who can access this um, proposed funding need to be tightened, I think we would be open to that. But it's it's like two sides of the same same coin, in my mind, and not a dramatic policy shift. Um, are there any other questions? I know council members that staff is um, I'm sure and on both both ends would like some direction on um, where we're leaning, and so. I, I don't want, but I don't want to spring a straw poll on anybody. Would it be helpful at this time to, 
to consider a straw poll? Um, or how are, how are people feeling? Uh, Council Member Fowler. Sorry, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to clarify one thing. Um, and I apologize for this. I was multitasking earlier. I literally was on like two meetings, two Zoom meetings trying to do this. But, but Cindy, um, with the, the alternative funding stream proposals that you mentioned, that would cover the full 1.1 that's being asked for in this program, right? For these programs, correct? Yes. Okay. So, um, I mean, I, I don't know that it's a policy shift so much as I haven't heard anyone disagree necessarily with the programs themselves and the renters programs, maybe some questions about the, the mortgage, but not the programs themselves, just where, what source the money is coming from. Um, I just needed to clarify that for, for me, that, that we could still fund the 1.1. Yes, you have several choices. Right. And I think what, uh, that's kind of what staff is looking for direction on um, is which of the options that have been laid out um, are people favoring. And Mr. Chair, if I could, if you're not ready to go that far, and we certainly understand if you're not, it just will help us figure out the rest of your budget options to know if you want to just go ahead and take it from the housing trust fund, or if you want to look into the other options more. So you don't have to pick an option. Just, just tell us if you want to just stick with the, the recommended one, or if you want us to keep, keep looking. Okay. Um, would someone like to, oh, council member Johnston. Thanks. Sorry, I used my hand raising function. I'm sorry. I missed that. Um, I, I don't disagree with the intent of helping folks. I think to the mayor's point, I think we do need some details about how we apply it um, fairly in coordination with the federal program that uh, Councilmember Dugan talked about. Um, I know there are some problems with the federal program as far as clarity across different lenders and how it's being implemented by lenders. And so there may be some problems in just relying on that alone. So I would be on board with um, Clearly, I would prefer using COVID money um, because one of my questions is, is this an intent to retain this particular mortgage temporary assistance ongoing after even COVID as part of our typical piece or is this a one-time COVID-related thing more? Uh, Mayor? One time. And, okay. and I think that... Um, you know, we, we started putting this together. Uh, well, the legis the federal legislation is still evolving and ongoing, but we, we put this together pretty early and, you know, so it's going through the, our, our process in city hall. And at the same time, the federal legislation funding potential and clarity about what kind of COVID dollars we're going to get has been marching along as well, but it's, mm -hmm. it's absolutely always been a one-time concept. Okay. So I, I think Mr. Chair, just from my point of view, um, the overall concept looks good to me. I think I would definitely put in uh, a clarity that COVID funds should be used for this as much as possible. And the intent to, um, however we look about funding the mortgage piece uh, or from the uh, land trust uh, should be backfield. Um, I agree with the mayor in the sense that we actively have a program to help first time home buyers in the home. We are helping them. If we are not um, also helping on the back end for those particular folks or a subset of folks who may fall through the cracks on a federal program, uh, be un un unable to access it for some uh, federal rules, those kind of things, I think we do need something to place for mortgage owners. Um, maybe with some AMI restrictions of at least 100% lower. And also be very clear, we would encourage folks from the city end to access the federal option uh, that Councilman Dugan talked about particularly um, as a first resort. Um, but otherwise, I'm, I'm comfortable with the proposition. Okay. So I think um, we've heard some feedback from 
council member Rogers and from council member Johnston, um, some clarifying feedback from council member Fowler. Um, do other council members want to weigh in and Um, I'll, I'll say that I feel um, at this point um, comfortable with the proposal, um, but I would probably support some of the caveats that Councilmember Johnson um, is asking about, um, asking that we include about COVID and encouraging people to seek other federal programs. But I, I'm not, um, I don't feel that uh, this is, a, a, as the mayor put it, a big policy shift um, from um, what the intent is and what we're what, what what our existing programs have done. So that's where I'm at. Councilmember Valdemoros. I I agree with you, Chris, in in, in that way, and I think there's no. I think we're pretty much supportive of helping um, folks that are in need right now during the pandemic. Or it, for me, it's I want to know or I want to have some guarantees. I, I mean, I get nervous not knowing that our housing trust fund will be replenished in the future. That's where I get nervous because we, you know, we have uh, we need to use those funds for other purposes that we all agreed on. And so Let's do it. Maybe we'll find an alternative where to find the funds. Or it is for sure that once we release those, they will be replenished with something. But it's a for sure thing and not, you know, we release them and then three, four months later, we don't know um, how we're going to replenish it. And there are other needs and all that stuff. So that's where I'm at. Yeah. Thank you. Council Member Fowler. Mr. Chair. I mean, I know what our staff needs, and it's certainly not a decision, but, and I don't know where everyone is, but I'd be willing to make a straw poll at this time if, if you'll indulge me in doing such. I will. <laughs> um, I, I would, my straw poll would be to give the direction to our staff to look at alternative funding for that to put that 1.1 million into the programs proposed by the administration but not use the housing trust fund money and look at the alternatives that have been provided and decide on a uh, or help come to a another way to fund it okay. So um, we have a straw poll from council member Fowler. Um, and so I'm looking, I see that um, council member Rogers is supportive of that. Who asked the question um, about this then? Um, um, yeah, go ahead, council member Johnston, so sorry. If our straw poll is the intent to not use having trust uh, funds, we, is that what you said, council member Fowler? Mm -hmm. Um, yes. Does that limit the ability to actually get need to people right now until we hear back from the feds about COVID? I'm not sure when that'll happen. Uh, Cindy, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounded to me that when you said um, about the, the, the alternative proposals that there were ways to still get that money out quick. Yeah, I mean, the administration um, needs to work with the providers to uh, get the programs in place and that type of thing, and you um, can adopt whatever. This is on the same timeline as the regular budget. Um, you could express your intent um, Tuesday. You could vote on the budget amendment Tuesday. You could. There's a m many many things you can do to keep this uh, going forward. You don't have a way to vote tonight because this is an extra meeting. But yeah, I, I'm not aware that this that anything we've talked about would make the program delayed. So I think does that answer your question, Andrew? I, I don't think there would be a delay in this. It would just be moving the funding source to something other than the housing trust fund. 
Yeah, that was my only concern is that by limiting from not using housing trust fund, does it limit the funds that are available now for mortgage assistance before we get to 90 days? What I'm concerned about is James, James said that 90 days, whatever the time frame we're going to have, I don't know what it is. Um, if folks haven't paid their May mortgage and they're going to miss out on June um, next week, essentially, um, by delaying it for a third month, it puts people in more peril to lose their house and harder to dig out from. The sooner the help gets there within the first month or two months of late, the better off they are. So that's my concern. And as far, we haven't seen uh, what the program parameters are. And so I imagine that would take at least a couple of days to get that together, unless the administration does already have that. Um, Council Chair, I could um, speak to that a little bit if that's all right. Yes, please. We do have those parameters um, with all three of the areas, rent assistance, um, uh, Utah Community Action is well in place and knows um, how to provide information and assistance um, for the rent assistance and then for mortgage assistance, both NeighborWorks, Salt Lake and CDC Utah um, are ready and we have uh, pretty detailed information um, from both of them on how would they how they would go very quickly into that implementation and then on rapid rehousing uh, the road home has been doing this a long time and they're ready to go too. So 24 hours ago I had checked on at least one of those providers and they weren't quite ready and they didn't know what criteria the city wanted so if you have the criteria and just send it to the council members then great so are you at 80 percent ami 100 percent ami do people if if the folks who already have a deferral um and have put their their loan payments at the end of their loan as council member dugan was describing would they be eligible for this program um, at neighborhood housing services they have all they, for the people who have asked, they have put the loans at the end of their, they've l allowed them to defer their payments until the end. Um, are those people going to be eligible instead for grants? So they already have a solution to their current problem, but a grant is a much better solution than just a delayed payment. So just those eligibility questions and things like that. Is that what you have already taken care of? Yes, Mr. I'm sorry, go ahead, Rachel. Sorry, Mr. Chair, do you mind if I chime in? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Rachel. Okay, thanks. So Lonnie, it's my understanding though that, um, you know, we, we haven't, we don't have specific contracts in place with the providers, but we could tailor those agreements you know, pending the approval of the council on these allocations, you know, we don't want to put the cart too far ahead of the horse here. So we, while we've had preliminary conversations with the providers on the kinds of guardrails we would put into those financial agreements um, or those, you know, what those assistance agreements would look like, you know, that's, that's pending this conversation with you all on, do you want it to be 80% or 60% and below? Do you want to, um, try to provide more specifically for residents who may not be documented in the United States, um, which is some, you know, some additional flexibilities, but also specificities that we can add to this, this funding source right now. So I don't think, you know, we're not, we're, we, we haven't been approaching this, like we're asking the council to make a big, huge policy shift in terms of the housing trust fund. You know, really the goal is we have access to, you know, this funding now and the flexibility to do some things with this funding now, not pending what the federal government may or may not tell us the strings are for the CARES Act funding. So, I mean, that that's the request on this is, is, is quick and more specific and detailed guidance that we can use to work um, with NeighborWorks, with UCA, with these community partners who are trusted, who we know already work well in our communities and who know specifically the needs, the unmet needs in our communities today, right now. So that's, you know, they're, they, they are well accustomed to multilingual and diverse and inclusive outreach. Um, they have the, those, they have all of, all of this, this lens ready to look at here. Um, so we're, we're ready to go on this. And I think that's, 
That's the request for the council to approve the housing trust fund money source. Okay. Um, so knowing that and that that was the clarification, I think that um, was being asked of the poll proposed by council member Fowler. Are there any, is there any other debate um, or questions before we go ahead with the poll? And remember, if you want, you can abstain from the poll if you if you don't have a decision right now, and we just then we won't we won't be able to to move forward. And well, we won't be able to get the direction that um, staff is hoping for. But um, can we restate the poll real quick? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want me so, to restate it, Mr. Chair? Or do you? Uh, I think I can do it. I think the. So the, the central question is, do we as council members feel comfortable moving forward with the administration's plan and taking uh, using money from the housing trust fund for the plan as stated, or do we want to instruct um, staff uh, that we are, and I would say by implication saying that we're not so comfortable with using the housing trust fund and that we want them to explore other alternatives for the funding source. And Amy's nodding her head saying that she uh, is in, that I restated that correctly. Thank you. Um, okay, I don't see any other hands up in terms of questions. So that's the poll. Um, if anybody, if everybody can just indicate on your screens and then I'll say verbally where, where it seems like people are. So the I'm up sorry, I'm still confused on that. that uh, so, because you had an or in your statement there. The first one was, say it one more time, sorry. I'm slow. Yes, council member Fowler's proposal is that we, uh, straw poll is that we ask staff to look into other uh, sources to fund the administration's request and that we not, um, yeah, that I'll just okay. stop. Okay. Um, I'm seeing a thumbs, uh, I say, Seeing a lot of reactions from Councilmember Johnston. Okay, thumbs up from Councilmember Johnston. Thumbs up from Councilmember Fowler, from Councilmember Valdemoros. Councilmember Dugan is a thumbs up. Councilmember Rogers is a thumbs up. I, I'm a sideways, I'm not sure. I, I, I hear what everyone's saying and I agree with a lot of what's been said. I think it's that question I asked that sounds unanswerable, but how big is the actual housing trust fund and what percentage would we be moving is, is kind of what I'd be interested in knowing, but it sounds like we can't get that answer. So, so I, I tend to, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm unsure still. Then with that, I'm kind of like also leaning this way. And the only reason why it's because if I had guarantees that this money would be replenished with whatever other funding sources, then I would be okay okay, but right now I cannot get that. So that's why I'm leaning more like, mm, let's find other sources. Well, anyway. if, if I remember correctly, the administration saying that it will be replenished, it's just a matter of when and where, like, is that gonna be federal dollars? Is that gonna, and is it gonna happen in the next 90 days or whatever? I think if, I, if I'm correct, the administration is saying that the money will be replenished in the housing trust fund. I don't think anybody can say that well, right. because it's up to you you guys. So you you are the ones that can say that. The administration can say that's what they'll recommend. Right, but that that's the plan, right? It's not their so, proposal, but they should speak to that. Mr. Chair, if I if I might, I hate to go ahead. So um, I, I know that this isn't a complete answer to the question, but when we when we repropose the housing trust fund source here, um, we originally we had proposed putting one point one million dollars and immediately deploying it into these three areas as you see before you. 
And we had recommended taking another million that is accessible now in the housing trust fund and putting it inside a sort of a holding account later. When we brought this back to you in, in the budget amendment number six, we clarified, or at least I don't know that we clarified it in the budget amendment, but our intention, we clarified it with staff, was with, with council staff, was to leave the one million just where it is in the housing trust fund, no change, no shift in uses or anything like that. So that that million, the half that's accessible um, in the housing trust fund would just stay as is. So right. again, you know, this is a matter of taking some immediate funds um, that then could be replenished or the intention would be to re be replenished either over time through repayment of these loans over time or through a different funding source um, but leave the million where it is. So if that offers the council any assurance, it's not like we're just wiping out the whole fund and using it for something else. Right. Um, and so that's my understanding and that's why I would be, a, I would be a thumbs down, but it sounds like a majority of the council wants to look into um, to other resources. So I, I guess that's what we'll ask staff to do. Okay. Um, so that brings us back to, um, our agenda, um, and, um, the rest of the items. So I'll continue to go through the items on, um, in the, the rest of that budget amendment. We're on section E, um, Volkswagen eligible. Uh, mitigation action funding agreement. Um, that's a miscellaneous grant in the amount of $1,554,615. Um, section F, there are no donations implicated. Section G is grant awards. Uh, item G1 is one Utah uh, child care system, state of Utah Department of Workforce Services, miscellaneous grant amount of 160,000, uh, Utah Department, excuse me, item G2, Utah Department of Heritage and Arts, Division of State History, Certified Local Government Program, 2020-2021 miscellaneous grant in the amount of $9,100. Section I is council added items. Uh, I1 is the release of $150,000 from holding account for 2020 jurisdictions with halfway house and payroll uh, violator centers grant. And that uh, brings us to the end of the items in uh, budget amendment number six. Um, are there any other questions about any items contained in budget amendment number six? Um, does staff need any additional direction on any other items or um, was it just, I, I think item D7 was the one that I heard all the talk about before. Um, so I'm assuming that we're, go, we're okay to go ahead and move on to our next agenda item. Yes, Mr. Chair. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so that puts us um, to agenda item number four, um, another really, um, easy issue, which is the fiscal year 2020-2021 budget for the Gulf Fund. So with us for this issue, for this uh, item, we have Allison Rowland, Council Office Policy Analyst, Laura Va uh, Va uh, the Deputy Director of Operations for Public Services, Matt uh, uh, Kamayer, the Gulf Division Director. Sorry, Matt, I'm sure I got that wrong and Noel Walkingshaw, Public Services Deputy Director of Administrative Services. So Mr. Chair, if I could just start out. Um, I think the context for the Gulf budget this year is a lot of uncertainty. Um, the budget figures that are in the mayor's recommended budget for 2021 predated the pandemic. So there may be a need for budget amendments later on in FY21. <clears throat> Excuse me. The other, the, one of the real reasons for uncertainty is that revenue performance is not known. So the Gulf Fund doesn't, doesn't know whether its previous predictions will be dramatically changed this year because of the pandemic. 
But on the flip side, expenses for the golf fund are fixed in the short run. And since an enterprise fund depends on its revenue to be able to uh, pay for it, cover its expenses, then that could be problematic. Things like watering courses, things like personnel, things like um, other sorts of repairs on the courses. So in the mayor's recommended budget, the proposal is that the general fund will continue to fund or rather subsidize at about the same amount as it did last year. In addition, the finance department has increased accounting transparency, including in temporary support for the debt incurred as a result of the irrigation upgrade, what some of us continue to refer to as the ESCO. There are a series of policy questions in the staff report. Um, one that I'd like to draw your attention to is whether you'd like to schedule some time to review the council guiding policy principles, which are in attachment C2. These were formulated several years ago when the council took a long look at, or a deep look at the Gulf budget. And some of them seem to be outdated and some of them may just need to be updated to reflect changes that have happened since about, I believe it was 2014 or 2015 that those were drafted. So with that, I will turn it over to uh, the Gulf Fund, unless there are any questions. Um, I don't see any questions, so let's go ahead and pass it over to Lorna. Okay, and I think Noel's going to kick this one off. Yeah, um, Noel, Noel is going to cover this one for us. Yeah. Okay, great. Noel, go ahead. Okay, and I just, I'm just wondering, we had a presentation. I'm not sure how we um, make the magic. It's, it's happening right now. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, I'll just kind of get started and I wanna just say thank you council for the opportunity to uh, discuss golf with you today and our fiscal year 21 budget. Um, you know, uh, like Allison said, this year is, is a flat budget and um, we're learning some lessons um, relating to the pandemic and the COVID. I, I do think though that, uh, and, and, and we'll try to tell a good story around this, is that golf played a pretty important role um, during this pandemic. And, um, you know, some of, the, some of the things that we've learned uh, is that uh, Salt Lake City was very lucky to have open spaces. Um, to have access to parks and trails and golf courses, right? Uh, golf played a, a role offering a community space for uh, families and friends to come together in a socially responsible way. We were only closed for a very short period of time. And because of the efforts that had started during the course of the year, and we'll talk a little bit about that, changing to finances or our, our point of sale systems and things like that, we were able to open up uh, in a no touch way. And I think that is, uh, that is, that is kind of neat. And, um, you know, many other communities aren't that fortunate. Um, you know, in the staff report, there was some reference to a study that the finance team did last year. And uh, we, we talked a little bit about this last year. And some of the things they found was that, you know, most cities don't have an extensive public golf system. Uh, most of it's private. Uh, they don't have uh, the public access like we have. Um, no other system that the finance uh, team studied uh, charges administrative fees to uh, the Gulf. And all but one was operating within a deficit. So um, we're not that unlike other places in how we're operating. Um, but with the difference is uh, we have more. And, and I think that um, that more is, is good. Uh, one of the roles, you know, cities have is to preserve and enhance the, um, I'm sorry, can we go to the next couple slides? Here's our, um, our golf division, division structure. Um, Matt Kamier is our division director, Kelsey Chug. And then each uh, golf facility uh, follows a fairly similar uh, organizational structure. Can we go to the next facility slide? And, and this is, I think, the, the guiding principles that Allison talked about. And, 
And I kind of wanted to talk about those and I, cause I do feel like uh, these guiding principles are, are important. Right. And I think that they're, they're definitely um, on my mind as we make decisions around, around golf. Um, you know, like I said, one of the roles that the city has is to preserve and enhance the quality of life of the residents and, and golf supports that. Um, you know, the guiding principle around, a neighborhood quality of life is enhanced by adjacent open space, regardless of the use and should be protected, right? We see this within the council's guiding principles. We see this within our master plans. We see this within our plan Salt Lake. We see this in our park plans. We just see it in our daily lives. And, and um, I think that um, that is, is very true today. We, we've, we've seen the benefits of, of having protected these public spaces. Um, and, and something else over this, you know, the last year or so, I've had the chance to meet with several developers. Um, there are many developers who would love to come and develop our golf courses, right? And they ask for long-term access. They ask for us to put up the money for infrastructure. Um, and in some cases, we had one recently, um, they wanted ownership, right? They wanted to own the facilities. They wanted to build them. They wanted us to give them the keys. And then they wanted to own the facilities on the property. Um, and I feel like it's our role um, as sort of stewards of these public places um, to be really mindful of that and, and what that means when, we, when we're looking at these guiding principles. And so we're being very mindful of that overall. And, and frankly, you know, I, I think in this last year, we also saw, you know, one of our public-private partnerships um, get boarded up, right? 1700 South, we have the Raging Waters. Um, we had a management contract with some folks there. And for years, we just sort of watched that facility um, decline. And uh, we, we turned the keys over, right? And now I believe that uh, over that period of time, we saw very little in profit sharing. And I've heard the number is somewhere around a million dollars now to demo that facility and clean the site so that we can get it ready for a new use. Um, I think that these guiding principles are really mindful of that, right? As we, we, we talk about that. Uh, at some point in time, um, we're going to, we're going to do some work with someone right on these public courses. We'll, we'll, we'll build on in our public courses to include community amenities and to include, um, you know, maybe more diverse opportunities. Um, but I, I, I think that as we do that and as we have those conversations and I think those conversations that are becoming um, more and more often, I think that, you know, these are three of the guiding principles um, relating to the golf fund and how we move that forward that are, are really important, um, you know, and, and, uh, and, and how we preserve our role in those public spaces. Um, and again, I think I want to, I want to go back to reflecting on, I don't know how many of you play golf or got out onto the golf course. Matt will talk about, uh, what we've learned during this COVID event and, and the new people that have come on to, uh, on to the courses as a result, the new families that have come over and, uh, and what it's doing for a community. Uh, it's, it's kind of a funny side story. My brother-in-law and his wife, she's a doctor. She just got a, uh, a job in LA. They're moving to LA for two years. They put their house up for lease. And um, within a few hours, a, a couple from New York had signed a two-year lease with them because they want out of New York. They got the okay to um, work remotely and they want to live someplace where they have access to recreation. They want to have live someplace where they have access to that. And, and so I just kind of want to keep building on, you know, just how lucky we are to have that. And, you know, and how these public spaces have just proven to be this, you know, what I would call like a pillar of resiliency uh, for our community as we've gone through this pandemic. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in our presentation. Uh, next slide, please. These are the direction statements that we work with with golf. 
We're trying to grow the game and develop talent within our organization. Uh, we want to make sure that our assets are improved, that they're functioning, and that we're protecting them. And we want to become a better community partner. We want to find good ways to do integrate community programming and to integrate more of the community uh, within the game of golf and within these public spaces. Next slide, please. So here, I think I'll pass the baton over to Matt. He's good with the numbers. Um, and so uh, we'll, we'll let Matt take it from here for a little while, and then we'll come back and answer a few questions, if that's okay. Great. Well, I appreciate your time, everyone, today. Um, as you know, we have a very diverse inventory of, of golf courses, and as Noel mentioned, probably more than most municipalities would want to take on at any one time. We've acquired these courses over a, a long period of time, beginning in 1905. Um, and so we've, they've, they're an integral part of the community in a lot of ways. And so as, as you know, they're, it's a, this is a very important discussion for a lot of people in, in decisions that we make, uh, making sure that they continue to be viable spaces for them to continue to recreate and, and be a big part of their community. Um, we currently maintain uh, over a thousand acres of open space at uh, seven golf courses at six locations. Um, we have 34, nearly 35 full-time employees, and we um, rely on upwards to 200 uh, part-time and seasonal employees to help, uh, help us maintain these properties. Um, throughout those seven golf courses, we also maintain 15 free practice areas uh, for members of the community to be able to come on and to expose themselves to the game of golf and to be able to practice uh, their game and, and to be outside in these, these beautiful environments. Um, as Noel said, uh, we've, we've experienced and learned a lot of things from, from the pandemic, and I will talk a little bit about that. Um, but just wanted to give you an, an overview also of the numbers um, of people that participate within our various programs, our leagues, our men's leagues, women's leagues, junior leagues. Um, we have lots of group instruction opportunities, um, all of which right now have been put on hold uh, during the pandemic. Um, when we move to our next phase, we hope to be able to jumpstart these programs again and to be able to continue to offer, offer those programs. Um, a couple of things that I wanted to mention around what we're trying to do uh, is we try to try to focus on things that we can control. Uh, there's a lot of market factors that have been in play over the, over the last decade and a half, maybe two decades in golf um, that indicate a very flat growth rate. Um, and so there's, there's only so much we feel that we can do to influence that. So the best thing to do is to look at ourselves and, and see where can we, can, where can we improve and, and what things can we do differently and how can we adapt uh, to kind of meet the, the changing environment that we're within. Um, one item that we have uh, is, a, is our customer email database that we've been able to develop that over the last several years. And this is probably one of the biggest, uh, as far as the golf industry, um, when I speak with people of how many uh, individuals that we have in this database, and it's a, um, it's a good, clean database that's opt-in, but it's, a, it's the envy of any, any golf entity in the country. Um, we have also have a very good golf app that we've developed, um, and over the last year and a half, we've been able to get the numbers over 16,000 downloads. Um, all of these electronic channels that we develop, I think, help position us better moving forward to understand our ever-changing golf clientele. Um, again, our social media followers were over 27,000 uh, through different, uh, different methods that we utilize. So if you could change to the next slide. This is just a, a graph showing our total golf rounds going back to fiscal year 12. Um, gives you just an idea of kind of where what we've been dealing with, the dip that occurred between fiscal year 15 and fiscal year 16 came as the result of closing uh, the Wing Point Golf Course and also the Jordan River Par 3 Golf Course. So if you can see, since fiscal year 12, we've been pretty flat, and that mirrors what's happening nationally. Um, I don't necessarily think this is a, uh, a, good, a good sign for, for a long-term 
However, again, I think we're holding our own and we're surviving in, a, in kind of a changing environment. And so we're obviously looking for opportunities where we can, we can grow the game. We're looking for opportunities where we can operate more efficiently and, and to continue to keep these, these golf courses as, uh, as, as viable recreation uh, amenities that also benefit the community. Next slide, please. This is a, just a quick snapshot of on a course by course level of what we've experienced through the last five years. As you can see, we were, we're holding strong, but we're not really experiencing much growth or decline. Um, as you can see after fiscal year 15, where we had wing point part of our inventory, uh, I think there was, there was some sentiment that if we, you know, the market would, uh, was, was a little overbuilt. And once that course uh, disappeared that we would, uh, we would experience a growth in some of those areas, uh, some of those other courses uh, as a result, but you can see we've not, uh, we've not been able to experience that kind of a picking up those additional rounds. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so th that, that's kind of the state of golf until we hit March which I don't think anybody could see coming. And, and obviously we've spent the last two and a half months reacting to, to the situations as they developed around us. I think one of the things that benefited us um, more so than maybe other courses in the market, we were already in the process of switching to another point of sale or a new point of sale system and an online reservation system, which allowed us to very quickly uh, implement online prepayments. So rather than having golfers come into the shop, um, we were able to have them book online and pay online before they were even arrived at the golf course. And so we were able to implement a system to get them out on the course without having any physical interaction or coming into the shop with our employees. So I think that that enabled us to, you know, very quickly to provide a safe environment, which was obviously the most important thing from where we were coming from but allowed us to kind of continue to offer these amenities and allow people out in these spaces to be able to take advantage of being outside, um, getting some exercise, to have a distraction from, you know, a very, a very scary time in, in, the, uh, in the environment that they were living in. So we were able to produce a plan that, that meshed with the state's risk phase plan. And this is what the slide represents. I won't go through every every item on here, but as you can see, as we transition through each risk phase, um, we start to release uh, new uh, things that we had previously restricted before. For instance, um, when we moved from red to orange, we started allowing single rider cart rentals. Um, we, we have some cafes that uh, we were in the process of getting a new concessionaire in place. Um, we were able to open a few of those to be able to offer some, some take and go options during this phase. Uh, moving to the next phase, uh, we'll continue to, to allow some more and more things become available. But again, I, I feel like the golf staff um, really responded proactively during this and understood that golf could play a role in the community. And, and I feel this next slide will kind of show you um, what I'm talking about there. So if you can advance to the next slide, please. Okay, what I have here are um, the last three months of our golf rounds, and I've compared it uh, to a three-year average for those same months. So just to give you an idea of what we were, um, what we were experiencing. Uh, the last week of March, um, when we were still trying to figure out what we needed to do and what the new restrictions were, um, we decided to close the golf courses for about, for about a week. And this, this wasn't necessarily, we weren't told to do it. We just wanted to be responsible and make sure that we had everything in our shops and in our operations to the, to the level of safety that it needed to be. Um, luckily that week was, there was snow on the ground that week, so it didn't impact play that much. Uh, but when we were able to, to open on, on April 2nd, um, I think the demand was, was, was quite high. Um, and it was amazing to see uh, the, the support that we received from the community and the, and the gratitude for being open and taking the steps that we did so that they could feel comfortable coming and, and still being able to use these spaces. Our employees, obviously, the safety, their safety was, was a paramount as well. And so I think, I, again, it's, it's, it's difficult to show up to work when you're not certain what's going on as far as the, 
the, the pandemic, but I think that we felt confident that we could keep our employees safe and still offer, uh, offer that amenity, amenity to the public. So when you look at our April rounds, we've exceeded our, our three-year average, but when you look at May, which we still have a few days left, we've far outpaced our May average. And that's also not only rounds, but that's also revenue. So we've already surpassed our projected revenue uh, for May as well. So the reason I'm pointing this out, one is to demonstrate that the ability of our staff to, to be flexible and, and to, to try and, and, and provide a quality product to the public. It also demonstrates the public uh, ability to, you know, to want to still be able to stay active and have a space to do that within. If we had not been prepared with this new uh, point of sale system, we would not have been able to uh, open up and offer play during this time. So obviously the first thing is to be able to provide this to the community, um, but also for, for golf to continue to try to stay as, as uh, self-sufficient as possible. And, and that's one thing that we've, you know, obviously have not been able to do the last few years and still part of our, our, you know, our, our strategy and desire to get to that point. Um, I don't know what June, July, and August have in store for us. I know we'll be moving at some point to the yellow phase and we have a plan for that. I don't, understand, I don't know what's gonna happen with the amount of unemployment that's in, that's in the community and, and how that will impact prices and people's uh, discretionary income and things like that. So I, it's hard for me to project beyond that, but the first three months of this anyway, I think we're, I think we're, we're, we're positioned pretty well at this stage. Please advance the next slide. There's a couple things that I wanted to highlight again that we noticed during the last three months that I think um, are useful to see looking forward. You know what 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 things have we learned? How can we change our operations to maybe still be prepared to handle whatever whatever uh, this pandemic throws at us over the next several months? But still, maybe there's some things that we can learn and implement into our current operations. So I have two two rows of graphs here that I'm comparing one with the other. The top row is during the COVID pandemic. Uh, and the, the time frame I'm looking at is March 17th through May 26th. And then kind of the numbers that we had before that time. So this first, the first box deals with our reservations. And uh, you can see right now, currently 73% of our reservations are all coming online. And the other 27% represent over the phone. We've continued to allow that, even though we tried to put, push people online as much as possible. Um, but none of the reservations or payments were coming within our shops. Previous to that, 22% of our online or of our reservations came online and 78% came from another source generally. And most of those were just people walking up to the course um, or calling the, the course. So our, what impact that had on our, our database um, and people, we were previously doing about anywhere from 22 to 28 percent of our bookings were online. Um, to go from that to 73 percent, that's obviously that's a pretty steep learning curve for a lot of our golfers. But it's something that we we think has been a benefit to us in that we're able to more accurately collect that customer data, so we can continue to communicate with them and can continue to analyze where the play is coming from and who our customer base is. And so again, I think that's, that's a beneficial um, outcome from this, uh, from this pandemic that we can learn from. We were, were able to add another 13,000 customer profiles to our database during this time frame. Um, and granted, we were switching from one system to another. However, these were this, this is good, clean, recent information and data that we can, that we can use um, in planning our system for the future. Uh, the, next, the next column there is the play type. So where the play was coming from. Um, previously, uh, most of our play was about 73% was just general public play and 27% came from what we refer to as membership play. These would be individuals that have purchased passes, uh, discount cards or, or other sources. Uh, but during this, uh, during the COVID time, that's jumped from eight to 81% of the play was from public sources and 19% from membership sources. So what this, what this demonstrates to me is that we saw a lot of new play, a new, new people coming to our courses. 
And, and so I think that was a good thing. I think the fact that we were prepared, the, the courses were in excellent shape. Um, I felt like, and, and I heard nothing but compliments from people just happy that we were open. Um, the county courses were closed during a, a large percentage of this time. So we were able to receive a lot of people from outside of the city, I think, into, the, into Salt Lake City to be able to play their golf. And that was demonstrated in, again in that, that massive influx of people into our, into our database. The last column dealt with, deals with holes played. So traditionally we see it's usually about a 50-50% mix of nine hole and 18 hole play. Uh, but during this, the, the pandemic, we see a 63% uh, for nine hole play and 37% for 18 hole play. Uh, I think the biggest factor there is the, the fact that we did not have carts available during the month of April and a lot of people were walking. Um, one thing that I did notice is I, I've, I've heard from a lot of people that they actually enjoyed walking they, and they said they're gonna continue to walk moving forward. Um, and so that's a good thing, I think, from a health standpoint. However, from our cart revenue, that does have an impact on that. Um, but again, I think I'm trying to find positives to take from this situation that we can apply moving forward. But again, as, I, as we, we do have carts available now, they're still single rider only. Um, but I'm still hearing a lot of people saying, no, I'm going to continue to walk uh, because I, I forgot how much I forgot how enjoyable this was. We've also noticed an, a positive impact on pace of play, which I think helps the, from the customer's perception of their overall experience when they can get around the golf course a lot quicker. Um, they feel a lot better about their about their experience. Uh, one other thing that we did during the, the pandemic is we have increased the uh, the intervals of time between our, our tee times. And I think that's had a positive impact on pace of play as well. So next slide, please. All right, so, so during the last fiscal year, I wanted to just talk about a, a few of the highlights of the key implementations that we had. Um, there's a lot, uh, and, and anyone that's been part of a golf discussion over the last, I would say at least decade knows, there's a lot of deferred maintenance on the golf courses, to the clubhouses, to irrigation systems, to equipment, um, we have a big gap to try to cover. Um, and there's uh, not a lot of revenue going around at this point for us to do that. So we have to really be strategic in how we apply any extra funds that we have to, to try and continue to at least address emergency situations as they arise within our courses, whether it's an irrigation system or a sewer system or something related to one of our, one of our clubhouses. Uh, but one, one, one area that we've identified over the last few years is, is we, have to, we have to improve our maintenance equipment. Uh, that's the key in the, the product that we have is, is the golf course. And being able to put these, uh, we, the equipment that we had was just far too old. I mean, it was ridiculous how old it was. So rather than, than coming up and purchasing new equipment, which is very expensive, we, we developed a process to purchase used equipment. So we, we purchase typically lease return equipment from higher end golf courses. Um, we're able to do that at a, a substantial discount and the equipment that we feel is, is, is nearly good as new. Um, in 2019-20, in that fiscal year, uh, we were able to, to purchase $214,000 worth of used equipment this way. Um, we feel like that had, that's, we did it the previous year as well. And that's kind of been our plan of hopefully over a five to six year time frame. We can, we can vastly improve our equipment situation. Um, one other thing that we did over the last uh, two years is to take a look at all of our, our clubhouses, again, which are very old and have not had, had any capital investment put into them in decades. Uh, but let's, we thought, let's, look, let's take a look at the, the restrooms and see what, if, if we can do, what we can do there. So a lot of the work that we did ourselves um, to be able to do this, but we've, this year we were able to complete all of the clubhouse restroom renovations um, we've also been able to do some, some painting and, and, and upgrades that way. Uh, I mentioned that we have some emergency repairs that we have to do. Um, this current year, we're in the process of replacing the controllers on the Mountain Dell irrigation system. We would obviously prefer to replace the whole system if we could, but we do not have the money to do that. So the next best thing at this point is to upgrade the controllers. Um, the cost of that was about $350,000. Um, again, that was not a planned uh, replacement, but it's something that we had to absolutely do um, without those controllers in place and without some some repairs to their uh, pump system. 
Um, there, there are several holes on that golf course that would not have received irrigation this, this season. Uh, another thing that we did was, uh, was to reassign uh, five of our golf course superintendents to new golf courses. This, this is part of uh, one of our workforce evolution plans that we have in place to try to uh, take some of the vast experience that we have and, and to shift them to a new environment and be able to look at that maybe with some, a new set of eyes and also to provide uh, a new set of uh, maybe experiential training to some of our assistants. Uh, but we were able to, again, it, it seems like a, it's a, a big upheaval to move that many people all at once, but I think the, the results have been pretty good so far. Um, in fact, I've, I've heard that our, our, all of our courses uh, from a lot of people have, have looked better than they have in a very long time. Um, so we feel that was, a, that was a positive move that we did this year. Uh, another thing that we were able to do is to secure a new concessionaire contract at five of our golf courses. We lost um, Western Foods uh, in November, which was, which was sad to see them go. Um, and you, as you can imagine, that's, that's a big hit for us to take. Five of our golf course cafes no longer have a concessionaire agreement. So we were able to secure a new concessionaire at those five golf courses and we're ready to roll with them. And then the pandemic hit. So. Um, we're a little bit further behind than we would like to be with that situation, but continue to have good conversations with them. And we have a lot of good ideas that we, how we think that we can expand hours at a lot of these cafe locations, that we can perhaps have some joint investment opportunities to improve the cafe uh, spaces and, and to make them more uh, presentable to the community and, and, and in hopes of being able to not only provide this service to golfers, but to the people who, who live around the courses. Uh, again, I mentioned we'd implemented a new point of sale and reservation system. That's not a, that's not a fast process. It takes about four months. But again, we felt fortunate um, that we had already started that, that process. Um, and we will, we will gain a lot from being able to have this new system in place, uh, including one thing is a new centralized retail purchase order and inventory tracking system that uh, I believe that will benefit us quite a bit. Next slide, please. Here are some of our key implementations uh, for this, this proposed budget. Um, the first item there again is uh, we plan to spend about 264,000 on more additional used equipment as we can find it. Uh, again, it's not something that you can necessarily plan for. You have to be um, ready to move when these items come available. And so that's, we, we've been able to at least budget that money and it's worked well for us the last few years and we'll continue to do that. Um, another thing that we're going to be doing is implementing an online individual lesson scheduling and payment processing system that would allow customers to go online and schedule uh, instruction and be able to pay for it online. I think that will be, that's a, a, I think a customer enhancement there and also makes things easier uh, for us to manage on our side. We'll be purchasing new range ball dispensers at all of our driving ranges at the cost of about $106,000. Um, what these new dispensers will do will, will be replacing older units um, that were a token-based system, which from a financial and accounting standpoint is not always the most desirable thing to have. Uh, but these new, these new range dispensers will allow for payment uh, via credit card or a smartphone at the dispenser. Um, and it will, again, I think that's will allow us to maybe tighten that part of our operation up a little bit, but it's it's more customer friendly. I think when somebody's on the range, they want to be able to just go and, and maybe purchase another bucket um, and be able to do that without, without having to go back into the shop. And obviously during what we've experienced in this pandemic, that would be something that would have allowed our ranges to perhaps be open during that time frame, And we might've been able to continue to again, offer that extra amenity and be able to receive revenue during that, during that time frame. We're also adjusting our existing lesson policy to include some new lesson initiatives and audit controls, uh, I think, that are necessary. Um, and finally, uh, we're, we're going to be introducing a kind of a new product into the market, which we call Game Packs, which are an electronic punch pass program. So the difference between this and maybe a pass is that it's transferable between people. So a family could purchase one of these Game Packs um, and then they assign people to it. So when they go to the course, they don't have to pay when they're there, they're able to just redeem it at that point, but they can purchase these online and redeem them when they come to the course electronically. Um, again, it gives us an, another, another element and a way to, for people to 
to buy into this particular program to play our courses and, and gives them another way to, to pay and to play. And I think that's a, to have more options is not necessarily a bad thing. So that is all that I have right now. If you wanna to go to the next slide. Um, and if you have any questions, I think we'll, we'll take those now. Mr. Chair, could I add a quick uh, bit of information? Yes, please. Just to supplement the information that Matt provided on the rounds over the past 18 years, 19 years, um, if you look at attachment C4 in the staff report, I pulled out Wingpoint and Jordan Part 3's rounds so that you can see what the other golf courses looked like, the trends at the other golf courses over that time period. Um, so what you can see, I think the two things to take away from that are the bad news um, that there are probably 80 to 90,000 fewer rounds per year system-wide. The good news, I think, is if we look back at 2007, 2008, 2009, there really seemed to be only maybe two courses that were affected by the Great Recession of that period, and those are Rose Park and Glendale. If you look at the other numbers, it's not clear to me that the recession had a big effect on playing at golf courses, on the amount of rounds played. So I think that's a good a good sort of piece of good news to take during this time of economic uncertainty that the effects of, uh, of the recession may not be overly large. So I just wanted to add those two bits. Thank you, Allison. Um, council members, que uh, questions on the uh, golf fund presentation. Council member Fowler. I just wanna say that I appreciate the um, app and the online reservations. I have been golfing four times over at Forest Hill and it's been lovely. Um, and it, there's been a lot of social distancing in that I went with people um, that I knew. I didn't see or talk to anybody else. Um, we did not go inside the clubhouse. We walked, which was great. And uh, the whole experience actually was really awesome. And, and, you know, I know that the mayor and the administration got a little bit of flack for opening up golf courses when they did, but as the mayor stated uh, that it's important that residents get out and get some fresh air and some exercise. And it was a, it's been a great way to do that. And I can walk down to my golf course. So everybody here knows how much I love golf. So I support all of the things. Just wanted to put that out there. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Fowler. Um, other questions from Council Members? This is this is a, probably a question for Allison. I was just looking at her um, at her sorry start her staff report. So Allison, can you tell us again? what was the budget was last year and what's the proposed one and then how much out of the uh, general fund i need to look that up it looks like yeah so it looks like um the fy20 bu uh, budget figure and matt or noel may have this number at his fingertips um but it was essentially twenty three thousand dollars less than the eight point five million recommended for FY21. So I can't do math while I'm talking, but that would be about eight point, a little under 8.4 million okay. for FY20. And then uh, the other question was about the subsidies, the size of the subsidies. Yes. If you look on the second page of the staff report, there is a chart that compares the FY21 subsidy and the FY20 subsidy you can see, um, and that actually includes actually one, one item that is not a subsidy technically. Um, you can see that the reimbursement of fees paid by the Gulf Fund to IMS is scheduled to be 200,000 for FY21, and that's an increase from FY20. The reimbursement of other administrative fees paid to the general fund is scheduled to be 3,006, or rather proposed to be, I should say, um, $306,000, which is also up from FY20. And then there is the general fund subsidy to the golf fund, which 
according to the proposal in FY20, it was limited to two years. In FY20, I believe that is proposed to be at 500,000. I may, it may be 565,000. Um, and I hope uh, someone will be able to correct me on that if that is incorrect. And then the final line on that, which as I mentioned, is not technically a subsidy or at least not a permanent subsidy, is the general funds transfer to the Gulf Fund to support the payments for the Gulf ESCOs, which were the loans for um, improved irrigation projects at Glendale, Rose Park, and Bonneville. This loan was structured as one that would increase in size over the, the course of it. But the proposal from the administration and the finance department is to essentially refinance that amount so that basically it'll, the city will be able to get a, a better interest rate. And because these are Gulf Fund properties, Gulf Fund assets that were purchased with this money, the debt remains with the Gulf Fund. So the finance department has, is very carefully tracking the amount of debt that the general fund is supporting at this point with the expectation that the Gulf Fund will eventually pay it back. Um, so, Allison, based on that table um, in the on page two of the staff report, so really the the amount of difference that, that we're um, subsidizing golf for FY twenty one is we're just we're giving less sixty five thousand dollars less than we did in the previous year. Um, not quite, because there's actually um, the reimbursement of administrative fees and IMS fees are also higher, or rather are higher than they were in FY20. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, I see that there, but those aren't, are those true subsidies? Um, I would defer to the finance department on that question. Yes, those are true subsidies. That's correct. Okay. And I think... Sorry, just chiming in here, this is Jennifer. Um, I think that's based on the fact that the um, all the other enterprise funds are charged those fees. I think there was a policy choice last year to say we still want to track those fees so we understand exactly um, what the you know what the the cost to uh, to the administration of the golf fund is, but that um, the transfer would continue that, that we wouldn't charge those fees. Essentially, Does that makes sense. Okay, so the only Okay, so the, the first three items in that table are truly subsidies, only the last one is not, because it's, okay. And I, I was able to do the math while um, Maribeth and Jennifer spoke. Um, the difference, though, without including the Gulf ESCO support, the difference between the two years would be approximately $83,000, so about $83,000 higher in FY21 than in FY20. And the total, so, and the total subsidies, the total amount we're subsidizing off was for FY21 is like roughly 1,007,000. Yeah. That's right. Yes. Thank you. Okay. And, and I think uh, Mary Beth maybe can help us. I, I'm not sure on the on the ESCO if the support towards the ESCO is considered a loan from the general fund. I believe that's a subsidy as well. Oops, I'm trying to take myself off. Sorry. Um, yes, I I don't I don't know that we ever discussed that last year or this year that it would be structured as a loan, um, but as a subsidy. Um, if it's a loan, I would have to restructure it in the financial system, um, which, and that would be, um, that's up to you. And I think um, the the other thing to bring into account, and uh, Mary Beth can correct me if I'm wrong, but actually state enterprise fund law requires that, that uh, enterprise funds support any debt that they incur. So, so that the, the the debt can't be transferred out of the Gulf Fund into the general fund. Is that correct? That's that's so. So the debt is not being transferred out, but the general fund is giving that money. I mean, 
we're giving that money for the ESCO, but the debt is not being transferred out of the golf fund, right? That golf fund owns that debt. They will own that debt when we do the refinance. It is always going to be their debt. Um, let's say next year they made $10 million more than what they ex expected. The general fund wouldn't pay that ESCO. The golf fund would end up paying that ESCO instead of the general fund because it is their debt. So then... So it wouldn't be correct to say that the fourth one isn't a subsidy. So they're, they're all subsidies. That's okay. correct. Hmm. Okay, other questions, council members? Council member Rogers. I wanna hear about this, uh, this tree nursery that you're looking at, Noel. I'm sorry, the what? The tree nursery. Oh, well, that, that's not, um, it, it sounds like that's not going to work out. Oh, it's, it's, yeah, yeah. That was something we explored. Um, and, and, uh, and then I think we've got to, I, I should read what Tony said because, you know, for me, it was a little bit of a, a heads down sigh, but um, yeah, that was something we were hoping to do to use some of those spaces, but um, but then the tree experts um, came along and, and told us it wasn't as good of an idea as I thought it was. Uh, can you give us, I, I was wondering about uh, a while ago, the prior administration did an RFI or a couple RFIs in regards to management styles for the golf courses. Um, and, you know, we really didn't get information on that. Is that something that you can share? I mean, what if that's something the council is looking at and asking the administration to go back out with some more, you know, scenarios or ideas to see if that might, you know, keep interest? Yeah, sure. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, Dan Dent came and made a presentation to the council showing the various outlines of the sort of management models that could be conducted through an RFI and did a summary of that. Um, we, we, could, uh, we could revisit that as a starting point. Um, you know, there were, there were models from where, you know, we managed the property, they managed the operations. Um, there were models for where we turn over the keys entirely. Um, and there were models where, you know, agencies came in and, incorporated and developed um, their own amenities within the system. So, you know, if, if that would be something we could certainly um, or at least in some that small study. group meetings, no, we'll maybe get together and maybe however you guys would like to do, that. to do that. Yeah, however you guys would like to do that. Okay, that'd be great. Okay. Council members, other questions? Um, Council member Dugan? You talked for, about one of your strategic points was growing the game. And growing the game, you know, you got to start out with the second graders and the third graders who go out there. And then I looked at the numbers and the junior participants was 170 something. Right. Part of that growing the game, because those are, that you grow the game for a lifetime. So when they uh, get be a scratch golfer like Amy, uh, they, uh, they play all the time. And so how, what's, what are your ideas of growing the game? Well, again, I'll let Matt answer that. He answers it better than I do. Yeah. Um, looking, pulling up that slide again here, the, the league, those were junior leagues um, that we have. So that's a, that's a weekly basis that we have them there. And that's obviously one part of our plan is to get them out on a weekly basis and play um, our junior clinic participants is just under a thousand of kids that we have participating in the programs. And again, we, we start them off as young as eight and, and our programs are designed to, to have kids all the way up to age 17 uh, to be within them, whether it's a clinic or it's a camp. Uh, we have PGA leagues, which is more like a, you know, it's a more of a team basis where there's two players per team. And we have that in a number of our golf courses. And, and we've been growing that the last couple of years. And we're really excited about, about how that moves forward. Um, we, we do training every year from U.S. Kids Golf for our instructors to show them, you know, proper ways to, uh, you know, to teach, you know, stance and swing and grip to children. And, 
And uh, so, yes, kids are a, a very big part of how we grow the game. And, and uh, we have a couple of courses where we have, you know, excellent programs, Nibley Park. Um, we do a lot of, see a lot of kids there. Uh, Bonneville has great programs. Rose Park has great programs. They work with the first tee program. Glendale also has a, a first tee program that, that they work with the Salt Lake City Police Department who actually staffs that program um, and serves the kids in the Glendale area. So that's, again, we recognize that, yeah, that's, that's a great place for us to be, you know, spending the time and investing in growing the game. Mr. Yeah. Trump, can I say one last thing? Yes, Council Member Fowler. I just wanted to say that, you know, <clears throat> I have been, I'm a terrible golfer, but I've been doing it for a really long time and did it when I was young and it, it, it is a lot of fun and I appreciate the programs that um, you are doing to get our kids involved because it does get them outside and doing something different and new and, and I appreciate that. And I just wanna say coming soon is the Sugar House Open. We are planning an event where we're going to be social distancing with all of our restaurants and then going golfing at both Nibley and Forestell. So I'll let y'all know that golf is a big thing in our neighborhood. And I really, and because it, it really creates a community and I really do appreciate what you guys are doing to, to diversify, to recognize the problems and try to come up with the solutions. Thank you. Okay, great. Any other questions on this item? Okay, uh, Councilmember Johnston. Um, so I'm inferring from this that the plan for golf is to keep it as a, right now, as an enterprise fund, but diversify um, Nibley and, and Rose Park. Is that accurate, Noel? Or, uh, and I'm, uh, I missed one part where you said, Something and then Nibley and Rose Park. Sure, uh, either Matt or Noel. Um, from, I'm inferring from this that developing Rose Park into a multi-use area and um, developing a Nibley um, golf center of some sort are the plans to help this, but the, yeah. the generally is to keep golf, uh, golf as an enterprise fund. Is that accurate? That, that seems to be the course. I think Nibley is, I mean, I think Nibley, we, we need to do a little bit of a reevaluation there. We went big and struck out, you know, again, I think when we looked at that RFI, I wrote into it what a lot of protection, right? Because I was anxious about, you know, just turning the keys over and, and people didn't buy. Rose Park to me is like this amazing opportunity. We have the Jordan Par 3 area. We have all that vacant space there. We want to build a trail. We provide, I mean, it's, it's an island in the city that needs community services, right? Especially as that area grows. We have, and so I would love to, you know, get some traction. We started having some traction on that. Um, and, um, I, you know, I think we need, need to uh, make some changes, but that's an area because of its adjacency to the Rose, the Jordan par three um, and that parking area where the clubhouse is, is so big and that lot area there. I mean, it's a, it's a spot for me, it would be a community space. I've had, I've talked to two or three people that uh, would love to put a hotel there. Right. Um, things of that sort, but um for me, I think Rose Park really needs to be a focus on how do we make that a really amazing community amenity. So I guess this is my this is my question. And the CIP, what's our CIP investment level at this point in the, the parks? The CIP investment level at the parks at Rose Park? No, in general, because a, a, a few years back, the intention was a dollar per round goes into CIP for parks maintenance stuff. Well, it goes into gen it goes into the golf maintenance yeah. and we've been using that money to fix things. Um, I can't tell you the exact dollar amount off the hand. And then we've also used that money to balance our CAFR, but it's, you know, it's not a lot of money. It's, you know, I, at, at the high point, we, we get to about a million dollars. I, the number that pops in my head is around 500,000 right now. 
Because we actually, if it sorry, Noel, if it yeah, corresponds please. to the nine hole equivalent rounds reported in 2019, it would have been 350. That's how much we would have collected. Yes. Yeah, I guess I was thinking about the, the, the amount that we actually have in the in the in the bank, so to speak. Yeah. Um, so it's not enough to really build anything. It really is a maintenance fund. Yeah, but our, our maintenance is is many, many times higher than that, correct? We have other. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I, uh, if you look at the if you look at the capital facilities plan that we put together a little while ago, the clubhouses score the worst on all of our city owned properties. Mm -hmm. They are our least, they are our, yeah, they're the, they're the worst. Rose Park, Glendale, I think are our two worst buildings owned by the city. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess I'm, I know we're in a pandemic and the budget's gonna change dramatically. No, particularly I, say, I suppose, but uh, the fundamental underlying question about having an enterprise fund that is so far behind in maintenance issues that I think it's struggling to be self-sufficient. I'm not sure it will be. Um, I don't think we've addressed that. And um, I, I personally think the parks and public spaces and golf courses and trails need to be together on an organized and sort of um, combined management structure so we can make holistic decisions about open space for the entire city and look sure. at the communities. But right now we're not doing it. So I'm, I know we're going to move through this budget cycle and do the best we can, but I think those questions are still sitting there for me about an enterprise fund that doesn't be close to cap covering itself. It doesn't have plans too in the near future, even in the long term. So, um, I mean, Mr. Chair, I know that we're not going to answer that here, um, but we're also making some uh, a big policy decision here, the discussions about Rose Park. Um, now we've been briefed on the concept before, but I don't remember uh, necessarily coming to a, a clear conclusion that this is direction we're all comfortable with. Um, but I'm putting yeah. it out there right now. No, I don't. I don't think we've come to um, any conclusions about golf since I've been on the council. So, um, I if there was a conclusion reached, I definitely. Yeah, that did not happen. Hey, so. Lana has something to say, and I think she's trying to, she's texting me, but I don't know if she can say stuff. I wasn't sure. Mr. Oh, Chair, can I just add something in? Yeah, of course. Go ahead. I think there's a lot of opportunities, and Councilmember Johnson is highlighting some of those, and, and they're in the, the nascent stage. We're still developing those. But there are a lot of things we could do that even include the Glendale golf course. And we're just not there yet. But I think that um, for, we've got intermediate steps we can take. There's some low cost things we can do to fix up clubhouses. There are some low cost ways that we can invite the community into these clubhouses with our concessions. And there are some really creative things. And we would like to talk to the administration first about some of their great ideas, especially around Rose Park. Um, I know it takes a lot of patience to do that, but we've got more than a thousand acres of beautiful uh, open space that is being supported by golfers. And we would like to have some more time to be able to develop some of those creative options in the future. That's all. Okay. Thank you very much, Lorna. Um, any other questions or comments on this agenda item? Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, and, and Jensen. Just one thing that Noel mentioned, the um, capital fund, it it is right now being used as a balancing figure and also for maintenance. The, when it was established, the council made some really strong commitments about it being used for capital improvements. And because of the dire circumstances of the fund, the uh, council moved away from that, but I, I, it might be nice just to have on the record at some point whether the council still has a desire to return to, to that, um, at, to fulfill that commitment, or whether it's okay to just consider it maintenance into the future. It's, it, it absolutely is from a practical point of view. 
but just so that we are carrying the record forward. Um, and I'm not asking you tonight, but I'm just asking, is that something that you'd like to come back to at a future date so that we can get clarity from you on, on what your long-term hope or expectation is for that? Okay. Sorry, was that um, just a reminder or a question? Um, if it's okay, we'll come back to you with that as sort okay. of an unresolved issue. We know there's nothing you can do about it um, right now, but just to keep it, um, keep that record clear. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Council Member uh, Johnson. Council Member Johnson. Johnson. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, I did yeah, see your hand up. That was a part of it. The, the heart of it is, um, and I'm not opposed to looking at golf courses in a multi-use way. I think we need to look at how to use them year-round, how do they incorporate into our overall um, public amenities for the city. My concern is turning Rose Park passively into a park, a multi-use kind of park with the, uh, the pathways, and I know one of them is um, delayed. Um, um, but then the maintenance of that is still a question that now we're going to have a maintenance in parks or a public park in the park enterprise, and then our regular parks over here, neither of which are maintained or part of the maintained. Um, and I'm still struggling with parks as a whole, and we don't have a good way to maintain them. Um, and then adding a public amenity into the enterprise zone there uh, that should be accessed by the public, but is in the enterprise. Does that make sense? Rose Park becomes a multi-use thing, but it's not clear to me sort of, not clear to me how the enterprise fund and parks inter interact in the public. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm getting a little confused in my head and that's just me perhaps um, about our direction. Um, and if we choose the golf courses to be a self-sustaining enterprise fund, do we have all six still being an enterprise fund? Because I'm not sure um, what I'm seeing is that it's not clear to me that there's really um, a way to make up anywhere near the balance to keep the enterprise fund self solved with all six courses. Um, so that's where I'm sort of, I understand the need for some patience on this. And, and you have been here longer than I have, um, Mayor. Um, you know how long this has been a discussion, but um, just um, I'm having a hard time sitting with it right now. So I apologize for taking the time to think through that, but it gets a little more muddied in my head it's, with this um, Rose Park plan going forward. Council member, it might be worthwhile for the council, as I think I mentioned before, to look at the whole set of guiding principles that was adopted several years ago, because I think questions like this are real and some of them might be addressed. At least the council may come to some policy decisions or policy consensus on how they might be addressed in the future through looking at that and deciding what's relevant now and what isn't. Mm -hmm. All right, um, council members, we are uh, now at item five on the agenda, which is um, the fiscal year 2020-2021 budget for non-departmental fund. Um, we are a, an hour behind. Um, I We are going to take the, uh, the 20 minute break um, after this, but um, I just want to let people know that um, where we are in terms of running behind on the agenda. Um, so um, let's move to that agenda item for non-departmental fund. Um, at the table, we have Russell Weeks, uh, City Council Senior Advisor, Mary Beth Thompson, the Chief Financial Officer, uh, and John Bike, the uh, City Budget Director. And then we also have available for questions, Marsha White, Director of CAN, Jen McGrath, Director of CAN, or Deputy Director of CAN, Brent Beck from Financial Administrative Services, Lonnie Eggerson Goff from HAND, Michelle Hoon from Homeless Services, um, Michaela Octay from uh, Planning, John Larson from Transportation, Orion Goff from Building Services, Matt Cassell, City Engineer, Dan Rip from HAND, and Elizabeth Bueller from uh, Civic Engagement. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? 
That's I can. Problem. Okay. Uh, the non-departmental overview can be found on uh, pages E85 through E90 in the recommended budget. The proposed budget is 1% more than the current fiscal year. Although at $186 million, the non-departmental budget is one of the largest, about 103 million of that involves showing where revenues are transferred to other city funds and services. Uh, the governmental transactions, the governmental transactions transfers and special revenue fund accounting sections are the main examples of that. The remaining $83 million is allocated for for general fund items, but again, several of those items are the topics of separate reports the council already has heard or will hear. That includes the golf fund. The other program section contains eight proposed expenditures that would be the same as the current fiscal year. Those include the hive pass, pass through expense, uh, debt service on body cameras, the local business marketing program and retirement payouts. The civic contributions, municipal, the municipal contributions and civic support section contains uh, proposed allocations for city memberships in, in public groups and financial support for nonprofit organizations. The six uh, city memberships that are listed in the, in the staff report are the same as the current fiscal year, and they really have remained fairly static over several years. The city programs and support or program support section also includes about 10 uh, items that are pegged at the same amount as the current fiscal year. That includes the uh, allocation for legal defenders, uh, the rape recovery center, the, and the YWCA uh, Family Justice Center wraparound services. Uh, two proposed areas that where where there might be decreases uh, or increases includes not allocating two hundred thousand dollars to the Department of Public Utilities in the next fiscal year for uh, its share of a property transfer between the city and the county. And uh, uh, and um, not allocating thirty-five thousand dollars for the jazz festival this year. There would be a forty percent uh, increase in funding for Tracy Aviary, but that's really a uh, that's really a uh, an accounting procedure based on an, a, an updated contract and an inflationary increase for the Sugar House. Park Authority of about twenty-five thousand uh, dollars. The council has uh, the council staff identified two policy questions uh, that the council may wish to consider uh, during its discussion, and I I'm going to leave it at that. Okay, thank you, Russell. Um, you want to uh, pass it off to Mary Beth. And John? They're available for questions. They have no presentation, oh. no formal presentation. Right. I just didn't know if they wanted to make any general comments or anything before we open it up for questions. Nope. I think we're good. Okay. Okay, council members. Hmm. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions here. I've got um, Councilmember Johnston's hand up in the chat area, but I wasn't sure if you if you have council. Yes, go ahead. Uh, the second policy question is I'm interested in about Sugar Out Park Authority. I know we're not increasing our parks um, a contribution for our city parks, so I wish we were increasing parks contributions across the board, but we're not. Uh, so I'd like to sort of get more information about the Sugar House Park Authority contribution. Um, that'd be helpful. So I can speak briefly to that. Uh, this is John Bike. Uh, we received a request from the parks, uh, from the Sugar House Park Authority. And in that request, um, 
it was obviously early in the budgeting process. And uh, they mentioned that the increase, the Sugar House Park is jointly operated between the city and the county, and the county has increased their contribution. And so the request came in for an increase from the city as well. Any questions, council members? Is that subject to be reviewed um, uh, again, since it came in prior to COVID and everything else? I mean, we can certainly look at that, but uh, we have not received uh, anything new from the Sugar House Park Authority at this point. We would be happy to reach out to them and the county as well. I believe that that's probably, it would be at least good for us to reach out to the county and Sugar House Park. I believe the mayor, county mayor is presenting a budget revision to the county council, I think this coming Tuesday. So it's possible that they have some ideas of where they're looking at cuts. I think reaching out to the county would be a good idea. Well, thank you. Um, other questions? Okay. Um, doesn't look like it. So I, I, I am that item. All I have is that I'm following up with the county about those questions and um, that we have nothing else on uh, that agenda item. So we'll go ahead and move on. Um, and that brings us to our tentative break. So um, we will go ahead and take that 20 minute break um, if everybody wants to uh, um, just mute your cameras and your uh, mute yourselves and your cameras and we'll be back in 20 minutes. Thanks. Okay. Um, I see Council Member Valdemoros. Um, I see Councilman Rogers and Dugan, and that's it. I see uh, Andrew's office. Oh, okay, great. I'm here. Thank you. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, the, the mayor's going to um, present to us on Item number seven, which is the fiscal year 2020-2021 budget overview for the capital improvement program. And then I know that um, the mayor has something else important So uh, after this. So um, you can move through this as quickly as you need to and um, step off, so. Thank you. So I didn't expect to be, be getting an early dismissal permission i appreciate that um, <laughs> well i am sorry that we're running so late so it's okay it's my son's birthday just so you know um thanks to council staff who i think are gonna tee up and share screen for me oh yes with some thanks bobby okay. yes i forgot to introduce our other presenters let me just do that really quick good so i'm not doing this by myself Okay, so we've got Ben Ludke um, from the council office, um, Kristen Riker from Public Lands, um, Callie Ruiz from um, the CIP programs, uh, or CIP program specialist, Matt Cassell, city engineer, Jim Cleland, the facilities division director, and John Larson, transportation division director. And then we have a whole bunch of other people ready for uh, questions, but um, I'm just going to um, skip that long announcement. It's like a movie credits down here. Oh. <laughs> well, this is um, CIP is always a big deal. And um, this year is dramatically different. And so I'm just here to sort of tee up um, where we are, what we are uh, working to own based on where we are, and um, kind of how we arrived here, given that the majority of this story, which is presented in front of you as a timeline right now, um, started um, a good deal of time before I arrived in the mayor's office. 
And a general CIP timeline goes from September to September. So that's why if you look at the top timeline of the 2019 process, it really starts in September of 2018. And I asked our staff to put together a visual um, depiction of what a typical CIP year looks like, which is the 2019 process. Um, shows you that we had 50 applications from Salt Lake City departments or divisions, 14 constituent applications, and about $21 million that we funded as a council then in 2019 through CIP. Um, then there's some blue pieces that you'll see those three little blue windows that um, indicate some of the steps internally. Important in that timeline is that the CIP coordinator left Salt Lake City in summertime of 2018. No, 19, sorry, September of 2019. The CIP person goes away. At that point, um, the, all, the work with the CDCIP board and the, um, the considerations that would be coming to the council were, uh, I guess, pretty well underway. So come, they, they left in, in the middle of summer and then come um, September of 2019, uh, the, um, the CAN department a, sent a memo to the Biscoopsie administration saying, look, we've lost this person basically, the CIP process has a lot of problems and we're gonna, I'm gonna show, we're next gonna go to a bullet list of existing CIP problems and um, Can said, let's, let's go about this in a new direction since we're gonna have to be bringing someone new on, we can try to fix some of the problems at the same time. So it was right around that time, now we can jump down to the 2020 process, which of course starts in September also. And um, the mayor at the time looked at that memo and uh, made a decision somewhere between September and October that uh, the administration was proposing an abbreviated CIP process, which is, I think, to say um, we need to fix a bunch of stuff, but here we are at the beginning of this year's CIP round, and we don't have someone hired because they didn't yet. Um, and actually, we didn't fund it until the following January. Uh, and so they said, let's just do a, like a mini CIP process instead while we unpack all of the problems and don't have someone to administer the program. At the same time, applications are coming through. You can see that around the October, November timeline where constituent petitions are starting to come in as they normally would. And um, so it wasn't until December and I, I really, I should mention that council, my understanding um, is that administration and council staff we're having some discussions during the fall of 19 about the fact that um, things were kind of broken and there wasn't someone to administer the program. And they, I guess that the administration was considering not accepting constituent applications. So come December, there was a letter sent from the administration to all of the constituent applicants saying, uh, we actually don't have the capacity to fulfill um, or to render CIP process for constituent applications this year. And, and I'm sorry. And when we get this fixed, we'll um, queue you up for the next round, basically. And then um, I should interject here that if any of the, the movie list of um, staff who are here to um, come after me need to fix anything I'm saying, because I wasn't the mayor at this time, please feel free to. But um, I'm, I'm giving you the best that I understand. So come December, the council and uh, therefore the constituents were alerted that we aren't accepting constituent applications this year. Council funded and um, posted the position in January, February as uh, the, the position, I guess it was hired in March of this year on three of 23, I'm sorry. That doesn't make sense, 323. Someone else can tell us what that means for February there. So Mayor, the, the CIP coordinator position was hired on March 23rd of this year. Okay, it's just pointing to the wrong month, but sorry. 
Yeah, and then the manager position though was was still posted at that time. Okay, thank you, Dan. Um, so anyway, you can see the rest of the process uh, as best we can anticipate at this point. And um, it's also important to see in comparison that we had 18 city applications and really zero constituent applications considered this year for almost half of the funds, just almost $12 million in funding. I also wanna mention that none of the CDCIP board meetings ended up um, convening because of uh, COVID obviously. And with uh, um, the dramatic shift in the way that the program was to be rendered with no constituent applications, um, they, they didn't really, uh, and I, this is Aaron talking, not on behalf of the CDCIP board, but um, they didn't really know how to render the program. Um, Bobby, will you go to the next list of bullets for me? So thank you. These are some, I won't read through this, but oh, that's even better. Um, some of the issues that were identified beginning way back in um, September of 19, when Can said to the Skoopsky administration, we've got some problems here. These are some of the problems um, which have to do with uh, the CIP person not having really authority or clear direction of how to render, administer the program. Um, it wasn't really tied to our 10-year uh, our plan. Um, hi. Uh, there, there are a lot of uh, disconnect between the departments. So we sometimes had multiple departments applying for the same project or pieces of one project that were not coordinated no standardized tracking of the application so that departments could see, oh, transportation's doing that and streets wants to do that. And they are both speaking about the same thing and we should coordinate. So um, Bobby, if you could go to the next one, which is what we're proposing. Uh, these are some of the remedies that we would like to, well, we're bringing to you um, and that have been in a part of some of the discussions, I think, between administration and council um, staff and to what extent with council members, um, I don't know uh, how many were able to connect with the small group meeting offerings that, that happened in the last several weeks. Um, but this is what we would like to do going forward. And uh, we, I, I mean, as a council, a former council member who loved the CIP process and um, loved seeing what our constituents brought forward, this is, it's sad that uh, this is the place that we're in. Um, and it's, when you look at the, the remedies here, which are really a, sort of the inverse of the problems that we looked at before, it's, it's sad that they, uh, that it got to this point over how many years, I don't know, but it's really too bad that such an important piece of our public engagement with the city and opportunity for communities um, became so dismantled or uh, wasn't, maybe wasn't created to be as important uh, impactful as the position in the city and the coordination of the process needed to be. So we hope that these um, these remedies or these discussions that we'd like to have with council going forward about making the process more transparent for the public and for our departments, more accountable and um, just work better and be able to serve our entire city better. Um, I think, I know we can get there but um, so anyway, I'm open to questions. I think that our uh, CAN staff may have some of the answers if, if I, they surely have answers that I don't, but I appreciate you giving me a chance to um, present a little bit about uh, what we know, how we got here and what the problem is that we're looking to fix. Thanks, Mr. Chair.
Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I just have some preliminary questions. Um, but I want to start out by saying that I, I understand that there are um, problems, inherent problems in the CIP process um, and any process when we have huge projects um, that are very expensive and we never have enough money to do all of them. Um, and I, I also want to say that I, I do believe that everyone that's in this discussion um, it has the best intentions for the city. Um, but I'm curious to know from Cam, when um, did discussions about not including um, citizen um, applications begin? Um, when we, well, I'm sure that uh, some of the CAN staff who are actually here for that can um, chime in, but my understanding is they began in the fall of 19. And I know there's an email that um, Cindy shared uh, with Rachel and me in uh, December, letting us know that there was like, this was, this was happening and wanted to make sure we were aware of it, which we appreciated. Um, I, I don't know uh, if CAN can step in or what that trail of memos, um, whether they're emails or they were in-person meetings, I don't, I wasn't here to know that part. So whoever was involved in those discussions, when did they start? So the, uh, this is Dan Rip, um, <clears throat> and I can speak to that. So the conversation started in September of last year with the previous administration about the possibility and, and outlining some ways in which we could abbreviate the process to make it manageable and, and make it workable. So that's when the conversation started. And when was the decision made that we weren't going to forward citizen applications to the committee for review? Um, so I believe that that took place, and, and these were all a combination of emails and conversations and memos um, that took place in December of this year. And that's when the letter was sent to the constituent who had submitted petitions at that time. Okay, and who ultimately made the de that decision? And that was the previous administration. But was it the mayor or was it the chief of staff? You know, I, I can't speak to that. I, I was just getting direction from those above me and my understanding is it came from the mayor's office. So I don't know exactly who it was in the office. Okay, and uh, so how soon after the decision was made did we start informing citizens that their applications wouldn't be considered this year? Uh, we did that immediately in December after, you know, we got word and we had briefed, you know, the new admin incoming administration, a letter was sent to constituents at that time. Mr. Chair? Yes. I, I just want to um, reiterate that that can came to the administration back in September, and it wasn't until December, which was after applications were received, that a decision was made. And I think that um, CAN staff was doing the best that they could and definitely was ahead of the ball on the, um, the application receipt process in speaking with the administration about a proposal for what needed to happen or what could happen. And it was a lack of decision-making between September and December uh, from the mayor's office. Um, can you, can anybody from CAN give any insight about whether uh, anyone raised the suggestion about involving the council in those discussions? Chair, this is Marsha White. We, we did have discussions with um, council staff regarding our intent to abbreviate the, the CIP process um, shortly after I arrived, which was in September. So um, probably October, November. Yeah, I, I'm asking because I, that's 
how I remember is that I was still encouraging um, residents in my district to submit these applications um, and telling them that that's something that, that there was an option that would be available to them for the council to consider in the spring. And I, uh, I think that, um, I don't know if I heard first from staff or if I heard first from my own residents that, that, that they were considering not um, allowing citizen applications this year. Um, which, I mean, as you can imagine, is embarrassing because you just told the constituents that they could do that and that they should do that and that they should put a lot of time into it. Um, so that's why I'm interested in understanding when the decision was finally made that that's how uh, the city would be proceeding this year. I'm not sure that can staff are aware of that timeline from the mayor's office side. Mr. Chair, if it helps, I could tell you when we became aware and what our reaction was. Okay. Um, it, it came to our attention after the applications had been solicited from the constituents, the public, and after they had been submitted. And so we, it was... Uh, Marcia and I and uh, Jen McGrath, or some variation of that group, would meet uh, periodically, and they raised it at that time. And I expressed significant concern to the point where I probably irritated them. Um, I think I did an email to the council about it at that time. I could be wrong, but um, I really didn't think it would ever happen because... Um, it, it was, the applications had already been received. So, um, and I saw a letter before, I, did, I don't know if it had been sent yet or not, but I again then renewed my expression of concern to say that this is something that is going to make constituents and council members very upset. Um, so... That's, so that was, I don't know if that was October, November. Um, it didn't happen during the Biskupski administration as far as I knew. Uh, there wasn't an official announcement that I knew of, but I could be wrong. I thought that they brought a request to our current mayor not until January when it was too late really to do anything different. And um, got a sign off at that time or made her aware but I, I didn't know that the I'm not sure if the letter went out in December or in January and they would know better than I would know well it sounds like the answer was that the, the decision was made in December and the letter went out in December so the Biskupski administration did make the decision is that correct? Who are you asking? Uh, anyone in the anyone that knows? Well, it. I mean, either they made the decision actively and sent out a letter, or they made the decision by default, placing this mayor in a, a situation where that could not have been reversed. And that's that's exactly what I'm trying to understand is like how we got into this point. And if there a letter was sent out in December, uh, that's obviously before uh, Mayor Mendenhall's inauguration. So there would have had to have been a decision, or we or we started sending letters before we made a decision. Can when did you send the letter to the constituent applicants? So the letter was sent in December of 2019. Again. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so it sounds like we, we do know. Um, so um, I see Councilmember Fowler, if I can just finish. Um, um, so now we could 
Cindy um, or Katie, if you're listening, the council could choose to consider all those applications, right? With, even though they didn't go through the normal process of going in front of the, the CIP advisory board? Yes, Katie can correct me, but yes. And has uh, uh, the council done that before? And what, if the council did, um, what did that look like? How did the council, did the council, was there anything the council did to try to supplement the fact that it hadn't gone to the CIP board? Um, I'm not aware of a situation where things, people who had actually applied didn't have their application go to the CD, CIP board, it used to be called. Um, so I couldn't, I, I think that there were cases where the council members brought in new applications kind of at the last minute or made suggestions based on needs that they were seeing or, or feedback they had received. And that, that was frustrating to the CDC IP board because um, they, they didn't get an opportunity to weigh in on those when, when that happened. But, but it, the council has funded projects that did not go before the CDC IP board in the past. Tried to avoid it, but have done it. And, but they didn't, um, but they didn't do anything like um, to try to supplement that for the lack of input from a board? Well, the items were subject to the public hearing process. Um, but that I'm not aware of anything else. Um, actively, an administration, previous administration, choosing not to take the applications to a board is is a different scenario. Mm -hmm. um, the council could always work with this current administration um, to to do some sort of follow up, like maybe ask that board to convene or something. The board's advisory to both bodies. Um, Can we get a copy of the letter that was sent in December? Certainly. Yep. Okay. Um, okay, uh, that, those are the questions that I have for now. Council Member Fowler, you had your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, I'm sure that the mayor went through this, I'm sorry, I was a, a little bit late getting on, but if perhaps Dan or Marsha or um, Jen could address the, what was so unmanageable about the, the system, I recognize that there were probably, you know, different departments, as the mayor mentioned, different departments are kind of asking for the same thing and, and stuff like that. But what was sort of like the top two most unmanageable things that they, we came to a decision to truncate the process? So Amy, this is Marcia. Sorry, Council Member Fowler, this is Marcia. You can call um, me. No, that, that's very, disrespectful. Um, so um, first of all, we didn't have anybody in place to manage any of the applications, not just not just constituent applications, but we didn't have anyone in place to manage the um, uh, internal applications either. So um, we didn't have a good way of being able to administer those. The second thing is that uh, the process of following, and I think the mayor outlined this early on, is that the process of following the CFP uh, was not available. We don't have a, um, a an updated CFP. And so I think those are the two. I'd like to turn it over to Dan at, just to see if there's maybe he has two different ones. Um, but I think the biggest problem was we don't have, or at that point, we did not have one person that had the authority to um, administer it and follow it and be actively um, involved in the, in the application process. 
Okay, um, Dan, before you go, I, I want to follow up on that a little bit is that I recognize I'm still new in comparison to some people that have been here for a while. Um, but this is my third budget cycle. And the two years prior, we were able to accept constituent applications. And I don't think that there was a dedicated CIP person at that time for those two years. So I, I guess, I'm confused at what changed this year, number one. And number two, if we knew in December, or we at least made a decision, somehow a decision was made prior, sometime in December, such that constituents were notified, why wasn't council notified? So my first question is going back to, so it worked the two years and presumably several years before that, what changed, what happened that, that we could no longer put the bandwidth to accepting constituent applications? I'll start with that question. Yeah, I think Dan can probably speak better to the people that were there before. My understanding is that, that we were, um, we had two people that uh, were in that position prior and they left because they, um, it, it is a very big job. Uh, you all recognize that and decided to fund um, a CIP manager. Um, so it really is a coordination of, of needing more than just one person. Uh, and at that point, I think in, again, this was prior to me coming on August, uh, maybe even June, July, August, we didn't have anyone in place to, to accept that. Um, And, and then, sorry, and then this, and I'll let Dan answer the other, uh, so the other part of that, of uh, um, the constituent applications, we did send council staff a, a letter that was going out to the constituents, um, and I don't know at what point in time, and I can um, look back, but it was prior to December that we offered a, a letter. And Council Member Fowler and all council members, I, if, if as staff, I did not get that forwarded to you, uh, I apologize. I can look back to see if I did. I know it was on our chair, vice chair agenda. I know I was really concerned about it, but I easily could have failed to get that to you. So I, I'll double check on that. Well, I think, and, and thank you, Cindy, I appreciate that. I think one of my concerns here is if, uh, well, I have, I have a lot of concerns, but um, going back to something that Chair, Mr. Chair mentioned is that, so if in, you know, we adopt a budget in June, we funded a, a FTE, we know July, August, September that we don't have anybody there. No, there's no like other. We can't hear you, Aim. Sorry, somehow it got muted. I didn't even touch my computer. It just, my computer apparently was like, Amy, stop talking. Uh, <laughs> But right, if we're, so if we're in July, as Marcia mentioned, July, August, September, we don't have anybody. We know when the deadline is. We don't have any communication during those months with the council to say, hey, we, you know, we, we're really understaffed. We can't, we can't seem to hire anybody for this position. We don't know if we can do this constituent thing. Mr. Chair, um, would you mind if I could speak to this, please? Uh, sure. Is that Jen McGrath? Sorry, Jen McGrath. Yeah. Um, thank you, Councilmember Fowler, for the questions. Um, oh, and we, um, we, as CAN administration, did go to the previous administration back in August, September of last year to express our concerns about um, 
both the lack of staff, and we did have full-time staff for the previous years to be able to administer the programs. Um, we just didn't, we didn't this year. So um, not only did we not have the staff, we didn't feel like we had good policy and procedure in place. And as the mayor outlined earlier, there were, there were some other challenges with the program. And so we had gone to the administration um, in the late summer, early fall to discuss um, the fact that we were concerned about um, all of those issues and how we could potentially truncate the process um, so we could, we could do it in a manageable way. Um, we started conversations with council staff in the fall to let them know um, they definitely expressed um, concern about that approach um, and, and disagreement about the approach, but we did start those conversations almost as early as we went to the administration just to send up a red flag and say, this is what's going on. We're understaffed. We don't have good policy around this. We want to take the time to fix it and do it right. And the fact that we don't have a person in place to do the work, maybe this makes sense for us to truncate this year while we spend some time hiring the right people, getting the right policy and procedures in place so that in the future we can move forward and have a really successful, really transparent, really interactive process um, with our constituency. Um, but we did, when we raised that red flag, we raised it to the administration and um, to council staff, but we didn't get um, specific direction from the administration until um, basically December. And, and as soon as we got that direction, we provided um, that information again back to council staff and we started putting letters together and we got that information out to people just as quickly as we could once that decision got made. Um, it was never our intention to keep that information from people, but rather to wait for a final decision before we push that information out to the public. Thank you, Jen, and I appreciate that. And I wanna be really clear here. I am not blaming anybody in hand or can or any of the staff that I know work very hard. I'm asking these questions and I think at times they're difficult and sensitive questions but I'm asking because our job as policymakers is, in my opinion, to create good policy that can continue no matter who's sitting in the seats, no matter who the elected official is. And so I'm asking these questions so I can say, all right, what do we need to do as policymakers to ensure that this process that we all, as Mayor Mendenhall mentioned, it's kind of one of my favorite parts. If I have a favorite part of a budget, it's going through the CIP applications and seeing what our constituents care about and being able to fund that, right? And, and I think I'm not the only council person that feels that way. And so to have this happen in this way is, it was just completely wrong. Again, I'm not blaming the staff that is there. I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. I'm saying, what can we do from a policy standpoint that at least puts in some stopgap measures here, right? So I'm trying to nail down and drill down to where the issue was so that we can say, well, do we have a reporting requirement in September when all of the applications are due? Do we fund two FTEs for it? Do we create a policy that says 20% of all CIP money needs to go to constituent applications? Right? Those are, and maybe that's not a discussion for today, but having these questions answered and asked, asked and answered right now allow me at least to start thinking creatively from a policy standpoint at how do we let this program continue operating in a manageable, awesome way no matter who sits in those seats. Council Member Fowler, I hope that you will be willing to continue to work with us as we try to create some really strong policy around this. And I think some of the ideas that you just threw out are the exact ideas that we're talking about. And so um, we really hope that we'll have um, your participation and support as we try to create really good policy around this so that going forward, we have an amazing process that works really well. Uh, Council and uh, Mayor Mendenhall. Thank you. And Amy, amen. We want to do that. I am not not going to make decisions. I want. I love CIP. I want CIP to be administered that way. I want it to be 
in perpetuity, no matter who's in office, there's a solid process. And I would, I would appreciate your help and if you want to help us through the process of shaping it and those items that we put before and the ones that you mentioned and any other council members um i hope you know that i i think i know you do from what you said that we we want this to be well and we want it to be well not because it's the right people at the table but because we're putting the policy together yeah. right. If, if I may just jump in also, and, and Council Member Fowler, if, if I may per help also provide an answer to your earlier question about, you know, logistics of the process um, and, and hopefully provide hope for everyone. But, you know, we lost our last CIP coordinator last June in the middle of last year's process and we quickly picked it up and we were able to move it through to the end. Um, and since then we have hired a new CIP coordinator um, who has done an outstanding job to, to carry this, this process forward, you know, as it has been a little bit debilitated. Um, but, but Kelly Ruiz, who is now part of our staff, has done an exceptional job in, in helping us pull this together. And so with the, the funding allocation that was given last January, um, as we posted that position and we were trying to find the right person, um, and now it, as it became subject to hiring freeze, um, you know, we are optimistic that once we're able to hire that person that we will have a full staff and this policy that everyone's, you know, talking about and that we want to put together to make it, to make it work and we're optimistic of that. So on a staff level. Yeah, I, I appreciate that Dan and Mayor and Jen McGrath, um, I mean, I, I started out my comments saying that I believe that everybody that's involved in this discussion have and has had the best intentions, but I, you know, it is important to know, um, it is important to know, you know, when there are, when there is a, a, a shift or, um, and when we let our residents down, those that submitted applications, that we understand, even if it was, you know, a confluence of events, understand what that confluence of event events was so that it can be prevented again. But, um, and I'm sure everybody on the council um, feels that way too, that, that we're asking these questions to, just to try to understand how we got to where we did. Um, do other council members have questions about, um, what um, about that process or about what the administration's proposed in terms of trying to remedy that process? Um, Council Member Johnston. Uh, the first question is you alluded to um, still having that position open. We may be revisiting the budget in November, December, but um, if there's not, if that's not filled by then, do you have contingency plans? Councilmember Johnston, this is Marcia. Um, and maybe I can have Dan speak to that. Um, we do not have a contingent, contingency plan for the manager position. However, we have a very good staff in place right now and are currently working on policies that will, um, that will hopefully help us um, you know, going forward. And in addition, we're looking at reporting systems um, we're tracking those a lot closer. So I, I do believe that even though if we don't have that staff member, we will be able to, um, as long as we can keep our current staff in place, um, we, we might be able to uh, have a contingency plan. At, at, although one person down, we might ha have a good contingency plan going forward. I think Jen McGrath might have some other um, comments as well. Yeah, um, thanks, Councilmember Johnston, for the question. Um, I think, as Dan said, we feel very um, grateful and lucky to have brought Callie Ruiz onto our team. Um, she comes to us with a depth and breadth of knowledge of the city and the city's financial systems. And she has come through and picked this up um, in a very trying situation, sort of at, at the very end of the process, and has done a remarkable job 
And we have the utmost confidence that um, Callie will continue to carry that ball for us um, with the help of Dan and his team and with the support of CAN administration. And um, we will continue to press on and work towards um, better policy and procedures and getting things in line for next year and working with the council on all of that, um, whether we have a CIP manager or not. It will be additional work. It might take longer than we had anticipated, but because we have such a strong person in place and because she has such great support around her and we're all so committed to not having the process be like this and to having it be a really good process, um, we will do it. We will make it happen. And, and again, we're committed to working with, with the council on what that looks like in the future so that um, everybody, when we come to this time again next year, um, everybody feels great about where we are. That's, those are strong words, Callie. Um, good luck living up to them, huh? Uh, she's she's every bit as good as I just said, and probably more. Glad to have you, Callie. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. So I was going to follow up with figuring out if there's a if we need a time frame to follow up with um, you all regarding this um, in the fall or. So what the right time would be to get an update on where you're going to be at that point. Um, I'm, I'm glad to hear your um, dedication to it and your intentions. Um, just don't want to get into a place of getting so far uh, into the process that we're going to struggle to get everything done. So um, I'll let it go with that. My second question, though, is more of just else. on the, the CFP budget book on page 10, A10. There's a list of unfunded projects for fiscal year 2021. Is that an exhaustive list of all the citizen applications or are there more that aren't included? Uh, eight, 10 unfunded projects. The table with about uh, two thirds are constituent, one third are uh, city initiated. I believe that that was the updated um, unfunded project at the time that the book was published. Unless somebody else online knows different, that's what I believe is the case. I just want to know if there's more constituent applications that are not included in this list that we have in front of us that we should be aware of for this. Uh, no, that is all of the constituent applications. And then the few of the city applications that were unfunded. Okay. Thank you. What page is that on? Sorry. Uh, A10. Just a quick clarification, though. I think that it, um, it it's probably correct to say it's all the applications that were not funded that were applications, but not necessarily representative of like all the unfunded needs <laughs> in the city. Sure. Which, sure. You know, right. Might not have had an application. Okay. Yeah, my concern was just the, um, the constituent applications. If there were some that are not included in this list um, that were just not part of the process this year because of Mr. Chair. Council Member Rogers. Yeah, mine's just a comment. Um, thank you, Mayor Mendenhall. Uh, you've been extremely classy and upbeat about this whole thing, even though I can see the frustration. So I just want to thank you and your team and, and how you have laid it out. I think the, the timeline and the uh, those were very important slides for us to actually see how everything usually transpires and what, what the difference was in the hiccups. And I look forward to our chair, Mr. Chair, scheduling that policy discussion around this so that we can make sure that it doesn't happen again. And the mayor had to step off, but I am sure she appreciates your comments. Um, luckily, it's recorded, so we can uh, play it back for her. Um, are there other questions on this budget item? All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dan um, and Jen and Marsha. We appreciate it. And um, Callie, thank you, too. Uh, look forward to having you. And um, thanks for your input. Thank you. OK. Um, we are on to item eight, um, which is our fiscal year 2020-2021 unresolved issues um, for the budget. 
at the table, um, we have Jennifer Bruno from uh, or the City Council Deputy Director, um, and um, I, available for questions again is a, a very long. Um, like everyone. <laughs> cast. Yeah, basically everyone. It uh, looks like Marsha White is the key grip, and uh, <laughs> John Lark is the best boy. I just, yeah, it's crazy. And our our whole budget team is the script supervisor. So, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, thanks to all of them for help their help putting together this document. So they're all on the on the memo too, and they can jump in and correct me where I misstate things. But okay, I didn't mean to in interrupt your inter introduction. <laughs> Yeah, how dare you interrupt my joke? And <laughs> I was going to play that out for several more seconds. No, um, go ahead. So this is the first of um, what will likely be a couple, uh, what we call unresolved issues discussion. And it's kind of like a catch-all for anything that has come up um, in previous discussions as we talk about individual departments that aren't possible to resolve right in that um, department budget discussion but that sort of have to be resolved before we can adopt an actual budget. So um, some of the things fall into the category of, you know, these are things that we're gonna adopt as legislative intent. Other things are sort of critical yes, no decisions like, do you wanna um, appropriate more money from fund balance or not? Or do you want to um, restore one of the budget cuts that the mayor is proposing? So um, the intention is not to resolve all of that today either. The intention is to get introduced to it today to the extent that you can sort of rule things out that helps but um it's just sort of to get feedback at our next discussion um you'll see more of a sort of a chart that's like a running total of your essentially like your balance of how it's usually how deep in the hole you are uh because obviously it's a lot easier to add things than it is to to take away things so um Staff will just keep track of those. And if, if there are things that come up in your mind as we're going through this list, please bring them up because this is the list as of about noon yesterday. And so there may very well be things that are sort of percolating in your heads now that um, aren't reflected here. And this is that opportunity to bring it all up. So we start with um, items that could affect revenue. One of the um, pieces of information that we received after the mayor's recommended budget was transmitted is that the mayor or the administration did not receive information from the county in time to essentially budget for the judgment levy. Um, a judgment levy is a one-time, one-year property tax increase that essentially pays the city back for uh, money that was due to the city, but that people in different formats protested. Um, and so um, this is sort of a one-time, one-year thing, but it, it's a thing that the council has chosen to do every year since I've been on the council staff because it's a, um, just from a policy basis, even though it falls into the category of a tax increase and does trigger the need for a truth and taxation hearing, it feels a little different than um, just sort of randomly um, increasing taxes because it is money that was due to the city. Um, the council cannot do a judgment levy any higher than is authorized by the county. So every year the county gives us what that magical number is um, that we can levy, and then we plug that into the system. What the administration received um, information just last week that um, there's about 1.3 million so far that could be levied by the council in this category if you were inclined to do that. Um, it could be more. We'll find out on June 8th, which is when we get our final property tax information from um, the State Tax Commission. And if it's more, we'll let you know. Um, I should have added a line item here in terms of items that affect revenue it, it, in that um, the other thing that we'll find out on June 8th is if new growth um, is what is proposed in the mayor's recommended budget. Um, sometimes it's more than was proposed in the mayor's recommended budget. And of course, we'll let you know if that if it is, that's always fun if it is. Um, the downside is, is if it's not, then the council will have to sort of rebalance the budget um, in that day, because it's a day's turnaround <laughs> between when we get that information on the 8th. But I'll, I'll keep you posted um, as soon as I get that information. Keep you all posted on that. So I don't know if um, council members have questions about the judgment levy and how it works, especially the newer council members. I, I don't know if I explained that uh, in a way that's understandable. One of those odd property tax things. Mr. Chair, can I just say that I don't think I will ever understand the judgment levy, but 
agendas. So I feel good about that part of it, just for the new council members' sake. <laughs> I, I think the challenge, especially in this time, is that it technically is a property tax increase, and so it will show up on people's bills. And so, um, you know, that's just something that, by way of transparency, that that is what it is. But um, like I said, the council has been doing it every year on the theory that if you sort of let those unpaid bills go, you have to cut into the city budget in order to balance the budget. So um, the next slide, if there's no other questions on that, I can't see hands because I... I see the screen uh, instead, so. <laughs> I, I see Councilmember Johnston's hand in the chat feature. Okay. And it's gone now. I apologize, oh. Mr. Chair, that was my fault. I failed that time. <laughs> I'll let okay, it be so last. <laughs> <laughs> so the next item is um, something we talked about briefly in the RDA context. Um, that the RDA has been collecting um, tax increment through the um, North Temple Viaduct BDA for many years. And for many years, the amount collected was just very small. And it, it would, you know, it would still be transferred to the general fund. Um, in the process of investigating sort of how much money has um, been used to offset debt service, um, we realized that the general fund hasn't necessarily used that money each year the way it was sort of intended because there was not a sort of automatic uh, application of the money to the debt service. It was sort of, there was one extra step that needed to happen that, that didn't happen. And so there's actually a balance of about 1.7 million in that account now. The, the downside is that it can only be used for debt service on the North Temple Viaduct bond. Um, but the good news is, is that if you, if you wanted to, if the council wanted to, you could use, um, up to the total amount of the fiscal year 21 debt service from that account, which would either in theory free up more money for CIP or free up more money for the general fund. Um, so it's a little bit of like a right hand pays the left hand, left hand pays the right hand situation, but um, it could free up some money for the general fund. So um, that would be about, you know, 996,000 is the amount uh, of the debt service for this year. One thing that finance raised is that um, they aren't sure that given the economy, um, if there is a decrease, if there's a dramatic decrease in the North Temple Viaduct increment, then that leaves the general fund on the hook again for that debt service. And so it might make sense to have a little bit of a reserve. But even if you used that whole um, debt service this year from that account, you would still have about 700,000 in reserve. Um, we don't have a way of predicting, you know, what the increment might be next year or the year after. It's a little bit of a, a guessing game, but especially since the general fund is so tight this year, we thought it was a decent um, thing to raise. So it would be one time though. So I'll mention that a couple of times as we go through here. So structural deficit, so back to that structural deficit conversation that will add to the structural, structural deficit for next year, but at least it helps with some of the needs this year. But we could questions on that. Yes, please. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. So we could pay on the debt service uh, everything that's like owed this year. Keep seven hundred thousand in the reserve. Free up some money in the general fund that we could just leave in the general fund for potential budget amendments later this year when we maybe or maybe not get through this pandemic. I mean, that's an option, right? Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, there, once you free up that money, you can choose whatever you want to do with it. You can choose to use it in the annual budget process. You can choose to use it, uh, drop it to fund balance so that it's ready to go if you need it mid-year to sort of um, ease the pain. Or you could add it, essentially free it up from the debt service portion of CIP and, and use it in the projects portion of CIP. So, or you could do a little bit of everything, right? So it essentially and becomes general fund money. Would that, if we sort of, I'm gonna call this like the freed up money, um, would that be the total 996,000? As, as far as I see it, yes. Um, I'm gonna put a little asterisk because when we come up with these brilliant ideas, we always have to like vet them with finance and the attorney's office. So, you know, I reserve okay. the right to be corrected by Katie at a later date. <laughs> Fair enough. 
but yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okie dokie. Um, then the next item is to um, take a kind of wholesale look at um, funds that haven't been expended from fiscal year 19 or fiscal year 20 funding our future line items um, and see if it makes sense to recapture any of that money to use as one time to balance the general fund. Now, the mayor's recommended budget in a way already does this with the trips to transit idea um, and that money is being sort of um, used on a one time basis to help balance the general fund. But there are other line items um, that are in that same category of you know, funds that have accumulated over years, but not necessarily been uh, fully expended. We did talk about one of them already in a budget amendment, so we want to be careful not to spend things twice, and staff will kind of keep track of that, so we make sure not to do that. Um, but the community land trust is that, is that example of that idea. Um, again, one-time money, so it would not be a help for next fiscal year, but um, this is one of those like unique, desperate times, desperate measures um, budgets. Any questions on that? Councilmember Fowler? Sorry, lots of questions today, apparently. Um, so do we know how much money is in this unencumbered or un not expended um, account, if you will, from uh, funding our futures? So we haven't done a wholesale um, review of every single line item, so I don't want to speculate on that. But one of the line items that we have confirmed is that community land trust. There's one point, there will be 1.25 million if you approve the budget as is, because 500,000 is slated to go there this year. So there's, you know, 700,000-ish right now um, in that account that we are not aware is a program yet. So um, we're just raising it as, you know, something to think about. One, one idea is that um, I know there's sensitivity to removing funding from funding our future and um, the commitments that were made there. And so to the extent that some of the council members' additions to the budget fall into the category of one of the funding our future categories, we could think about sort of what those funding, this could be a funding tool that's aligned with a funding need within that funding our future world. And Jen, I appreciate you saying that because it was one of the things I wanted to point out is that as we're kind of coming back to these unresolved issues, I, I for one, and I think I can speak for James because we've talked about it, um, I, it's very important for me that this funding our future money stays in the funding our future pots that we put it in. Um, and so I think that to the extent that we can track those pots, and I know I'm kind of putting a lot of work on staff, but kind of track as much as possible the dollars in which pot that came out of, I think that would be important as we're looking at, at what we do next with it. Um, again, I know that's a lot of work and I, I don't want it to be um, too high of an expectation and it, I don't, I certainly don't expect any sort of perfection on where it came from, but but to the extent that we, we could get an idea, I think it's important because we did make some pretty solid promises about where, how, where and how this money was going to be spent and, and put a lot of our own political capital out there um, with those promises. So I think it's important to make sure we keep them in those yeah. pots. And, and I think that the administration has done a lot to um, advance their own tracking of each line item and each area, and that helps us significantly because then that's less that we have to track. Um, the, the challenge this year has been that it's not just a problem of money shifting from one place to another, but it's also that the pie is smaller. And so it's separating out those issues of what, what are policy changes because of an intentional choice? And then what are policy changes because we just have less money than we used to. Um, and so staff is tracking that. And later on in the unresolved issues, we'll go into a little bit at least, so at least you have an understanding of what the categories are, how they're changing, right? So that, that that's one way to look at it. Okay, any other questions on that? Well, I, I'm sorry, one more thing. I think, if this may also, Mr. Chair, lead to a future discussion of changing policies regarding those four pots. Not that we would change those four pots, but maybe expanding or 
or not expanding what those pots can address. But I would just ask chair, vice chair, to maybe keep that it for a future agenda item of if we need to come to that, if, you know, of kind of looking at that funding our future money. Um, yeah. Uh, the next item is, oh, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry Gilbert, go ahead. Can you scroll back up just a little bit? I failed to mention one thing on the North Temple Viaduct. And that's that um, I'm gonna be looking when we go back to the council that we, make sure that that money is used in that area. I think there's a lot of things that we can do to make sure that happens. So I know that it's in the RDA, but we know how that all came about and how the North Temple Viaduct uh, project area came about. So that's why I'm looking at that as a council to come back to do that. Just to highlight that for staff and, and you, Mr. Chair. Great, thank you. Okay, so next would be, um, and I think that this was also mentioned in the budget amendment discussion, um, if the council had any policy direction for how the CARES Act um, funding is allocated. There's a little bit of a chicken and an egg thing going on, I think, where the administration is working on ideas to, um, and, and responses uh, that are needed in the community with this money. But then also um, the council as the budget uh, authority you could sort of inform that, but obviously the administration is the one who, who are gonna carry it out. So they may know um, on the ground sort of where that money is needed. But to the extent that you had any um, guidance on that, um, we could include that in the budget, sort of as Cindy was mentioning as an anticipatory budget, if there was a direct need that you um, identified. And um, just to be sensitive to the administration, we can work with the administration on that so that we make sure we're not like running counter to the, what their goals are. They probably overlap. Mr. Chair. Yes, Cindy Guest Jensen. Yes. Um, uh, if the mayor or Rachel is available, uh, they might want to address this, but I'll just say that we had a, a good conversation with um, the administration yesterday um, clarifying. Um, some of the follow-up for council member Valdemoros on uh, some of the equity issues and things like that. And um, the administration has already done a lot of work on um, identifying needs and establishing the principles that they are going to follow internally relating to um, an equitable recovery of the community. And so we were just brainstorming and I don't know, you know, whether the council will want to do this and whether the mayor will want to do it. But one of the um, things that we were just chatting informally about is maybe the administration could share with the council some of the uh, principles that or guideposts that they're thinking about and they could have, you know, a, a discussion together with you so that you're not coming up with with some guideposts independently and they're coming up with separate ones and, and then we have a um, confusion. But um, anyway, so that's a possibility. Uh, don't mean to jump ahead to say that, but if they, they would be, you know, addressing that at some point or they could say now if I'm up in the night. Mr. Chair, this is Rachel since the mayor jumped off for a bit. Um, I'll chime in. Thank you so much, Cindy, um, for the kind words and um, for just teeing that up. We have done quite a bit of work um, trying to define, you know, what what how we're going to define an equitable recovery and what that looks like and how we might fill the needs that we've already seen be exacerbated by this pandemic. And we're really looking forward to having that conversation with the council, getting you know your feedback and thoughts on. Uh, what the needs are that you're seeing in your districts and um, and how we can work together to make sure that we're addressing those. So we're looking forward to bringing that to you in the next couple of weeks. Okay. There's no other questions on that. Okay, we'll go to um, uh, options to discuss affecting expenses. So um, one of the things we realized as staff over the last couple of weeks as we've been reviewing things is that um, a significant amount of policy ends up getting driven if um, funds lapse to fund balance where 
they essentially have to be reappropriated before they can be used for that purpose in the next year, or if they're treated more like capital accounts where they can accumulate money over the years um, sort of automatically, or if they just sort of um, sit there sort of unevaluated for years. There are some cases where that makes sense, obviously with capital projects that take multiple years to finish. Um, we wouldn't wanna have to have people sort of rush at the end of June to reappropriate money. But there are some cases where it's kind of a gray area um, if something belongs in a capital account or um, more of a lapsing account, like a typical general fund account that would lapse to fund balance, where then the policymakers could sort of review all the funds together and say, do we still want it to go for this purpose or would we rather that funds, those funds be utilized for this other purpose? So um, there's not a specific idea here, but it's more of a general um, idea that staff and the administration will be looking at in the coming days, weeks, months, whatever, um, to get a more kind of streamlined, regular approach. Um, one of our staff, um, Sam, told us that um, the state actually, um, every single time they appropriate anything, there's an auto, there's a, a notation if it's a, a lapsing account or a capital account. And I think that we can probably pretty easily implement that kind of system in our world, um, but probably not for this current budget, but it can be a goal. So I just mentioned that so that as you hear more about that in the future, you can give us your guidance if you have anything on that. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, now we're gonna get into sort of follow-up items from different department discussions. So some of this might sound like a rehash, but the intention is just to see if there's any different guidance um, based on what staff heard in the um, discussions or if, you know, upon reflection, you feel differently about things. So this is just alphabetical, it's like no order. <laughs> so the attorney's office. Um, in that discussion, the council members mentioned an interest in finding a way to authorize additional staff to handle the increasing workload. Um, one of the options that is available to do that is to just restore the vacancy savings of $31,000. Um, which would allow them to hire a vacant assistant city attorney. If the council wanted to um, consider just adding FTEs absent the vacancy savings idea, we've provided some of the costs for what those FTEs uh, might be. Um, so uh, I don't know if there's any um, preferences on um, what approach you wanna take or if, you know, I don't want to push a straw poll tonight, but that's not the intention of tonight. But if the council has any guidance as we narrow things down, that would be appreciated. Mr. Chair? Yes, Councilmember Johnston. Uh, this isn't directly related to the attorney's office at all, and I, I don't um, have any qualms with trying to add help and staff to them. Um, my biggest question has been thus far the, plan, the um, um, yeah, planning department. I know that the administration talked about some um, some ordinance restructuring that would free up time so they could do all the things we've been talking about, but I'm still deeply concerned about their staffing levels to get planning and zoning redone in the city. Um, so I'm concerned about adding positions across other departments without having confirmation there. Mr. Chair, I agree with Councilmember Johnston. Okay. So what we can do as staff is just keep track. Um, uh, so we can keep track of everything, um, all of the things that you're interested in. And I, I mean, at a certain point, the council does have to sort of make a judgment call um, if you wanna add all of it, or if you decide that it's more important to add planning help than it is to add attorney's help. And that's sort of for you guys to discuss um, amongst yourselves, but some of it might, um, be informed by what uh, revenue tools are available, right? So um, what our staff can do, so I've just added for the next unresolved issues to consider adding planning staff. And what staff will do is find out what that, you know, fiscal note is essentially, and then um, we'll get come back to you. And I see Councilmember Fowler has her hand up. Go ahead, Councilmember Fowler. Thank you. In um, the attorney's office, the blah, 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 list here on the little eyes, the prosecutor position that actually comes from Sims office, right? Mm -hmm. I think technically it's funded through the city, but it would be located in. Sims right. Office. I just was separating them as far as the presentations. So my preference as we're sort of talking about narrowing this down is to 
look more at funding um, the litigator legal secretary positions than that prosecutor position. We don't need more prosecutors. Um, <laughs> and no offense, Sam. Um, but those are more important for me, the, the um, two I and three I. And then, um, but I agree sort of with planning, but I think that'll be kind of as we battle it out for the things that we do when we're getting down to the end of the budget. But just as, like I said, as we kind of narrow it down, my preference would be litigator and legal secretary there. Okay. Um, I, just to add to that, I, uh, I share that with Amy that I think that looking towards the legal secretary and the um, litigation role are, are more pressing, but I would say that I think we should still consider funding the um, um, victim advocate because uh, that was also asked for. Um, it, it sounded to me like during the, the presentation from the prosecutor's office that uh, that it would that would be more helpful to them anyway than the additional prosecutor, and maybe that would help alleviate the need for an additional prosecutor. Mr. Chair, so I will. Um, thanks, Councilmember Mono. Uh, yeah, so I, I, if I remember correctly, the victim advocate was with the justice, the municipal court, not rather than the attorney's office. But then there was also a victim ad advocate for the police department that was requested. Uh, I, I'd be interested in. The justice court doesn't have a victim advocate. The victim advocate is in the prosecutor's office, and then there's also a victim advocate at the in the police. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for that clarification. I, I'm interested in both of those and maybe a discussion as to which is more pressing within those or if the if it should stay with other places as well. But I, I'm interested in that discussion at least. Okay, we'll make a note of that. So the next item, um, if we're okay to move on. Mm -hmm. Okay is in community and neighborhoods. And um, again, in no particular order, one of the um, ideas that uh, multiple council members have raised is to identify funding for um, the in-between that was discussed during CDBG discussions in April. So um, staff is following up with the administration to see if they have a recommendation of where these funds might most be, be most appropriate to come from. Um, just because sometimes when we come up with ideas on, on our own, it, you know, it's counter to what uh, the initial purpose of those funds were. And so, um, but if there's not a, if, if we can't identify something with them, um, we can always uh, work with you guys to see what um, funding sources you might want to consider as well. I don't know if there's questions on this one. I think. I, I do have a question, Mr. Chair. Yeah, go ahead, Councilmember Johnson. I think if we're gonna if we're gonna fund a project that wasn't recommended um, over everything else that wasn't recommended in there, I want some more details about. That. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of applicants who didn't get funded at all, just like the in between. Um, why would we go out of the way to make sure the in between gets funding outside of some of the other projects versus everything else in there? That's my only concern. Well, my answer to that would be because we already straw pulled it when we made the decision not to fund it during the um, CDBG process. So I feel that we, in some ways, already committed ourselves to this one because of our previous draw poll. I mean, I know that they're not binding, but um, but I think that uh, I know I would have um, made an attempt to reallocate funds. Um, if I had known that um, that the commitment to try and find funding was going to um, change down the line, I have no problem with that, Mr. Chair. My my question is, how do we, other than the struggle, how do we justify them getting this money somewhere else in the budget versus everybody else who applied? That's my only concern. So, Mr. Chair, Councilmember Fowler. I'll be quick, but I understand your concern, um, Councilmember Johnston. But if we look at the 
the budget, there's a line item for the YWCA and a line item for the Rape Recovery Center. I don't know, that was before my time, but I mean, and this isn't a line item, it's finding one-time funding that we kind of said we would try to do. I mean, I get it. I don't know how those others are justified. I don't know how all, uh, some things are justified, but it, just some food for story about the YWCA and the Rape Recovery Center, but, but you know, I don't mean to take us down that rabbit hole. <laughs> we, we can talk about it offline, Jeff. I'm happy to share that background offline, uh, Council Member Fowler. Thank you. Kate, go ahead. So we'll um, keep working on the funding source for that. Well, actually, um, <laughs> to add um, one possible funding source is, and this is the only time that you'll ever hear me make this recommend or this raise even this suggestion not recommendation, suggestion or idea, is that um, I don't know if um, because a lot of events this year have been canceled, um, if there might be funding available in the ACE fund um, for this year only, but um, maybe we could look in, maybe staff could look into that. We'll check into that. The last I had heard about the ACE fund because the um, allocations are typically made um, before the spring since so many of the events are in the spring and summer that the administration and maybe um, Rachel or someone in the administration can jump in was considering um, essentially allowing the organizations to keep the funding just because um, as more of a show of community support um, than anything. But I don't know that that's I don't know that that was for all of the ACE funding or just some of the events. So we'll check on um, that. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't want to take back any of the funds if they've already been allocated. But if there is money that hasn't been allocated because of this year, because of the circumstances this year. Check on that. Um, the next item, if we're OK with that, is um, the transportation funding from the county, which is uh, essentially managed by the transportation division in CAN. During the work session, some council members indicated an interest in seeing how that funding can be more aligned with sort of what is the ideal CIP process where um, all of the projects are sort of vetted together. Um, general funds can be combined or leveraged with impact fees, which can be leveraged with class B and then in theory, this funding. Um, whereas what was presented in the budget is really kind of more of an independent uh, transportation fund um, source. And I think that in the um, briefing, it was discussed that the um, goal that the transportation division, division has is to use this funding as a way to implement an independent um, transportation improvement plan. Um, and so given that we're this far along in the budget, it might not be possible for the council to sort of change how the process went to allocate to certain projects but you could add this to your legislative intent that asks the administration to um, consider a, a process change for this funding for next fiscal year. I don't know if the council has strong feelings one way or the other on that or if other, there's other thoughts. The theory is that a citizen board um, tends to look at things like um, geographic equity, constituent um, desires versus just staff desires, things like that. So. Um, I don't know how you feel about that. Council member, does anyone want to weigh in on this item? I just don't know enough about it to weigh in either way. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, uh, that's fine for now, but at some point we have to address this before the end of the budget process. And what we could do is um, oh, draft. Member Dugan, were you trying to respond? No, I just got to get educated on it. Okay. <laughs> um, it's, and, and, this is oh, Cindy. I was have just a suggestion that you can figure out what to do for this year, even put it in a holding account briefly if you don't have time to discuss it until July, and then work with the administration on uh, how that would relate to the redesigned CIP process in the future. OK, 
Hey. That's um, fun. Sorry. I, I, I was just going to say, I think we can move to the next item. Okay. So um, this item, I think we've already pretty much touched on because it relates to the revenue item we talked about, the funding our future programs that have not yet started. Um, you could ask, uh, if you don't want to recapture it as revenue, at the very least, you could ask the administration for like a status update of those programs. And the next item is um, the housing trust fund dollars for development. So um, in the session, the council indicated an initial interest um, in formalizing that all loan repayments from development or loans to the housing trust fund be transferred to the RDA housing development trust fund with the intention that they continue to revolve the development. Um, Budget Amendment 6 would obviously have um, uh, uh, taken some of the money that is currently in the Housing Trust Fund from loan repayments. Um, based on the council's straw poll last an hour ago, whatever, um, it sounds like we'll find a different source for the budget amendment programs, the, pro the programs that are proposed for budget amendment. And so what we'll uh, prepare for the unresolved issues tracking sheet is a transfer of that 2.1 million to be added to the RDA housing development trust fund. Sorry, it's a mouthful of all the trust funds. <laughs> so, um, and then um, with the legislative intent indicating that, you know, as loan repayments come in, those can be transferred either through a budget amendment or waiting until the annual budget, those would be transferred to RDA, uh, to the RDA housing development trust. Can I ask a quick logistical question on that? Go ahead. So if we transfer, which is my preference, but everybody knows that, transfer every, that housing trust fund money over to the housing development trust fund in RDA, why do the payments have to go through, the repayments have to come through to hand? Or is it just part of the loan the way that so this is written. This is Mary Beth. Can I speak to this? Yeah. Um, I believe that what we would do is we would transfer the entire balance sheet over to RDA. Balance sheet meaning the accounts receivable, all the liabilities. So if the council chooses to do something like that, we would transfer the entire program over. It makes it cleaner for hand. It also makes it cleaner for RDA. And we would make sure that um, everything in hand has an ending balance as of June 30th, and then we'll move that entire balance sheet over to go forward with. So, so then payments would just go into that balance sheet. Like for example, people don't necessarily know or care who they're paying. They're paying in their minds, the city back, right? right. Um, so it just goes to that balance sheet and then we wouldn't have to worry about two different funds and moving money or things like that, right? That is correct. Okay, thanks Mary Beth. Uh -huh. Our staff just wasn't sure if the contracts had any bearing on if we could just unilaterally do that. So like Mary Beth obviously understands that too. So I like <clears throat> simpler is definitely better. <laughs> the, the less times we have to do a budget amendment, the better. So we'll work with finance to make sure we reflect that the right way on the budget. Are there any questions on that? I, I don't have any and I don't see any. Okay. So um Another um, discussion that came up during the CAN um, discussion was funding for homeless and camp cleanup. Um, we combined these a little bit. Some of the funding is in public services. Some of the funding is in hand. Um, they're all related, so it feels a little difficult to kind of tease out which area they belong in. But it seems like there was a general sense in the council that you didn't want to necessarily um, think that the current proposed budget will necessarily be enough to carry you throughout the year. Um, and so you could allocate a little bit more money in the um, annual budget, or you could um, acknowledge that this is probably one of those things that you'll be back for a budget amendment to address. And I don't know if the council feels strongly one way or the other. Mr. Chair, could we use uh, the COVID funding for any of this? That's a, a question that I think we discussed with um, Rachel a little bit, and it seems, you know, in theory, especially if we're having to do more camp cleanup because of um, COVID, because we're now requiring people to, you know, socially distance and camps of less than 10 or 20. Um, but again, it feels a little bit risky to plan on that necessarily. 
um, unless there are new guidelines out there that we're not aware of. So um, that is something we're looking at. Could we maybe earmark this for um, like a reimbursement part, like Mary Beth was talking about earlier? We were talking about the CARES Act stuff, you know, that there is going to, or we anticipate at some point in the year, there will be a kind of a reimbursement from the federal government. Is, can we kind of earmark this as if it falls in within a, one of those guidelines? that it should be reimbursed. Does that make sense? Yes, and I think that that's one of those things that we would work through, um, probably need to work through with the administration to just see to what extent that aligned with um, this uh, uh, plan that they're doing to ensure sort of an equitable recovery. Because I think to the extent that we budget reimbursement from those funds, that's sort of less funding that's available for whatever other initiatives they, that, that are coming up with. So it's just one of those balancing um, questions. And I don't know if Cindy or Rachel have more. Mr. <laughs> Chair, this is Lisa. Can I can I address that? Uh, yes, go ahead. Um, I would say um, to Council Member Fowler's point that we are tracking all of the expenditures that were um, that could potentially be uh, refunded by CARES funding or HEROES funding or any other funding source related to COVID-19. We are tracking those and Mary Beth can speak to that. And then at the appropriate time, we can be able to determine whether or not any of those expenditures can be refunded by that, by those allocations. Awesome, thanks Lisa. You bet. Yeah. Mr. Chair, I, I would, um, I don't know the current funding level for this particular thing. And I think that um, it should be a high priority. The reason I say that is right now we've got some significant issues around uh, First South, um, Second to Fifth East, North Temple, and Fair Park, um, not Fair Park, Ball Park. Um, depending on how this goes down in the next few weeks, it could affect all areas of the city, particularly Sugar House um, and some other areas that um, may not feel it right now. And it could be a major constituent issue. And so I, um, we probably want to flag this one. I, I, I don't know the amount of money needed. And I think clearly it should be on our agenda for a mid-year um, budget revision. Uh, but I think this could be significant, particularly through the summertime. I think it may be less significant come November, December when we're already talking uh, about a, a budget amendment. But I think front-loading it this year is going to be uh, something we may have to look at. We'll make a note of that. Mr. Chair, can I just add one more thing. Um, something that the mayor was mentioning the other day, the group is coming back to all of the partners soon this summer to talk about how to fund the winter solution, so to speak. Um, so we have to remember that the state probably has some federal funding and the county does too. And so hopefully we'll all stay in that partnership approach. Yeah, I think maybe just to clarify, Cindy, the, I'm not sure they'll come back with funding or recommendations as much as maybe what to do, maybe not quite know how to fund it. And that's where the discussion with city, county, state. Got it. Thank you. There's a, no other questions on that. Um, the council had asked for more information about the new mortgage assistance housing program. I think that we talked about that a bit in the budget amendment discussion. So if there's any additional information to talk, but I think that it might have been covered. Um, um, one, council, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Do, is it of interest to see the criteria or the program scope um, before your meeting on Tuesday, council members? Do you wanna see the criteria or who's eligible or those for, sorts of things so that you're aware? For what program? Sorry, I stepped out for a second. Uh, for the housing stability, whether that's um, rent, 
assistance yes. or mortgage assistance. Yes. 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 Our staff will follow up with the administration to see if we can get that criteria. The next item is based on a request um, for, from council members to understand all the changes in funding our future and the funding our future categories. So um, I don't know if you want me to read down all these bullet points, but it's basically each category and what is or isn't changing. Um, talking about the 1.7 million that had not, it's actually 1.5 million, that might be a typo that had not been spent in fiscal year 19 or 20 on the home to transit program. That's one time revenue to help balance the general fund. Um, it increases funding for overall housing, that bucket of um, funding our future. It in increases that by 1 million. It decreases the funding for CIP by 1 million. It decreases the funding for transportation by approximately 1.4 million. Um, it decreases the funding for infrastructure by approximately half a million although it does continue the streets crew. Some of the decreases in that category had to do with not needing to purchase equipment again. So it was one time money last year that didn't need to go forward this year. And then um, one of the largest um, in decreases is the elimination of funding for police vehicles. And again, it's hard to dis decide other than the 1.7 million in one time funds that are being used to balance the budget. It's hard to tease out which things are being eliminated or reduced based on a policy decision and which things are just because there's less money. In the case of the CIP decrease, that was a very um, deliberate choice by the administration to say, instead of putting 1 million into CIP, we are going to add that money to the housing programs because they're needed, especially this year. But in the other cases, it's possible that the decreases are more due to just the shrinking economy. Are there any other questions on that? And then, Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chair, just uh, add and subtracting. What's that? Uh, the bottom line of that? Those bullets. Um, I I would have to pull up the attachment. <laughs> okay, that's, that that's fine. I'll I'll do that math when I'm not talking, and I will get back okay. to it. <laughs> but it is on the attachment. So if you look up attachment one and you scroll to the very bottom, it sh it will have the two amounts last year's. Okay, total. thanks. Total. Yep. Um. Okay. Then uh, information uh, that council members raised in CAN, that the CAN briefing, that feel to staff like they can be addressed on a longer term basis. This is just our understanding, so please tell us if they're more urgent, that um, you, you want an understanding of how you'll operationalize, the, the administration will operationalize the lessons learned from the emergency loan program um, to accommodate geographic equity. And I think um, Rachel discussed that a little bit earlier. Um, one councilman requested re metrics or review of how the $90,000 funding for HRC neighborhood mitigation went um, and sort of requesting a re review of that. One councilman requested a review of how integrating fire inspectors into the building permit process has improved processing times for businesses. We actually, um, hot off the presses, just got an email from Orion about that request and Allison forwarded it to you guys. So you should have that in your inboxes as of like half an hour or an hour ago. Um, they report that um, all of the businesses are sharing very, very positive feedback about uh, the integration of that um, inspector into the building permit review process. But they're sometimes able to turn around requests the next day, which is a marked improvement. So if you have any follow-up questions from that, um, just tag on to Allison's email and we can pass that along. The next item is that um, one council member requested additional information from departments on the broader efforts towards traffic calming, not just the sort of $100,000 um, that the council allocated. So um, if there's nothing else, we'll go on to the next department. Okay, please do. Okay. The 911 Communications Bureau, we just wanted to clarify that the 32 hour work week pilot program that the council discussed a lot in the briefing is actually not a part of the mayor's recommended budget, that the administration intends to sort of keep investigating that, watch how revenues and expenses are doing um, in the overall economy, and then they might be back to the council later in the year to recommend that program. Okay. Then the police department, um, some council members expressed an interest in funding additional mobile surveillance cameras We've got a cost on that about $40,000 each. 
that would be a one-time need. So that's one nice when you can find some of those because they're <laughs> easier to fund. Uh, one council member expressed interest in finding uh, funding an additional police victim advocate, which is different than the prosecutor's office victim advocate. So if it comes to that point when we're discussing it, council may want to talk about which area um, it makes more sense to add that position to. And I and believe we got clarification that that cannot be funded through the CARES Act funding now. Is that right? Cindy, maybe you are more. Um, I don't know about that piece, but I think that the chief followed up and said they might be able to cover that in a grant, but maybe that, maybe, well, we'll just have to double check it. Okay. You might know more than I know. <laughs> well, or it's possible I'm mixing up, <laughs> I'm mixing up uh, positions. So that's very possible this time of year. We'll, we'll confirm that, and if when we list it on our um, sheet, we'll have a note if it can be funded from a different source other than the general fund. And then some council members expressed an interest in adjusting the overtime budget for police, recognizing that the actual spending regularly exceeds the budget, um, and especially given the current um, uh, situation. The, um, one of the questions that um, council staff had was that could some of the overtime that police officers are needing to spend be reimbursed with CARES Act funding. So that's something that um, we would also have to revisit with the administration if it's possible to use CARES Act funding for that. And then just to add one thing to this, I had asked in our um, chair, vice chair pre-planning meeting today, that um, in light of um, events in the news and um, in the feedback that I'm getting from constituents, we had talked briefly during the police department presentation, I'd asked about um, uh, uh, de-escalation training. And I would like, uh, I've asked council staff to ask the administration if we can have the police department come back and talk to us about that a little bit more um and explain um why they think that they don't need more in de-escalation training and if they were to receive more how that would be spent um i think that that's important for everybody to know that that i put in that request this morning okay. or this afternoon <laughs> we'll add that. I I we'll that. Also add. sure thank you We'll add that both as a potential funding increase and as a legislative intent, as it may result in like a future council briefing. Um, public services, if there's no other questions on police. Nope. Okay. I don't, I don't public see. Public services. Um, some council members uh, discussed a desire to increase funding for weed abatement or just general park maintenance. Um, or other areas where budget cuts may be more public, publicly noticeable. Um, I don't know if council members want to discuss that more as a fallback if funding isn't available for that. Um, we can discuss with administration ways to really clearly communicate to constituents what they're likely going to see this year that's different so that we have a clear set of expectations. Um. I don't see anybody um, raising their hand on this, and I know we need to address it at some point, but um, we also are almost two hours over on the agenda, so I think I would prefer not to have that discussion. Great. Um, right. And then the, the last item in public services is just the Gallivan staff, and these are um, some ideas that maybe belong more in the legislative intent category as instead of the... Um, funding, not funding category. So um, staff can come back to those when we get to legislative intent concepts that um, were raised by a couple of council members, including council member Mono, about how to um, make sure that the public understands uh, who they call when, um, make sure that we're not duplicating um, administrative services, and then just raising the issue, the question of um, sort of setting expectations for staffing level and program spaces. Um, we could also talk about this more during the RDA budget follow-up, which is on June 2nd. 
I don't know if there are council, specific council member thoughts on that item. Um, the next item, it relates to a public utilities item that I believe we are going to bump to next to Tuesday, to next unresolved issues discussion, um, because I think staff wanted to do um, a little more outreach to interested parties. And Lehua, I think, has more on this. Just confirming that we were planning on moving it, so we don't need to talk about it tonight. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. And um, contingent appropriation ideas. This is something that we haven't talked about much in this budget, I realized, um, but it was a huge part of last year's budget because it was the first sort of big year of funding our future um, sales tax funding. Um, and maybe for the education of new council members, a contingent appropriation is basically where the council puts in the ordinance that the administration cannot spend this money that you've approved until they do X, Y, or Z. And so um, in the, with the respect to the sales tax funding, um, in attachment three, you'll see all of the um, conditions that were attached to the sales tax funding last year. And what we're providing them for you again, just to see if you're interested in still attaching those strings to um, the sales tax funding. A lot of them relate to things like reporting, getting a sort of regular reporting from the administration about how those monies are spent, um, and when and um, sort of metrics, things like that. We've learned a lot this last year too about the limitations of our own financial system. So I'm not sure any of us would recommend like quarterly reports again, but maybe, you know, biannual or that kind of thing. So um, if the council's still interested in attaching some contingencies, maybe our staff can do like a quick cleanup based on the last year of experience and recommend for fiscal year 2021 what would make sense to include as a funding contingency for this item? I don't know if council members feel strongly about that. And then if there are other things um, that come up where um, you're not comfortable in releasing the dollars until you understand more about it, um, like was mentioned with the transportation funding, we can add that. Um, that is in its own way a contingent appropriation. Uh, you, know, you put it in a holding account, it's in the ordinance listed as a holding account so that um, the administration has the um, funding allocation and they can start planning around it, but they can't actually start spending dollars until you're satisfied that it's they're being spent in the way that you are okay with. Okay, so we'll just keep moving on that. Um, I think we've been tracking some legislative intents while we've been going, and so we'll just kind of keep all those. The only one that I thought, um, or I shouldn't say the only one, uh, there are quite a few that, um, you adopted last year that might make sense to continue this year. This was the only one that came to mind when I was writing the staff report, but reading Allison's legislative intent staff report today, I was reminded of a whole bunch of others. So maybe we'll just save that conversation for your actual legislative intents briefing. And then you can tell staff which um, items you think it makes sense to continue and which items you think, no, oh, we're not as interested in that anymore. And that's it. Only two hours over. Sorry. Hey, we did it. Although now we have a closed session, huh? <laughs> but thanks for your patience. Wait, with you? Let us know if there's anything. Okay, if everybody would um, go ahead and log off here and proceed to our closed session meeting. Um, we'll see you over there in a few minutes. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Good work today. Mr. Chair? Around May of every year, the City Council begins public hearings on the budget. That's where you'll be able to have your say, whether you think we should spend more on a certain road, 